Thank you. Good morning, all. Have a nice day to all. On behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, I would like to start this webinar in the name of Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar series, which has been conducting by Hello. Academical Council of On Indian behalf. Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses yes, since sorry. the last December. This is our third international webinar of this series. This time we are focusing the pediatric emergencies. As we all know that every country in this world agreed to reach the United Nations, Nations Sustainable Development Goals to reduce the child mortality rate to at least as low as 2.5 percentage in all countries by 2030. This would mean that more than 97.5 percentage of all newborns would survive the first five years of their life, no matter where they are born. Currently, we are far away from the goal for 2030. If you look into the statistics, you could see that globally, 3.9 percentage of all children die before reaching the age of five. That means on an average, 15,000 children die every day. Despite dramatic reductions in child and youth mortality rate over last 30 years, under five mortality has dropped by almost 60% since 1990. But the global burden of child mortality remains immense. In 2020 alone, 7.1 million children died mostly of preventable or treatable causes. So aim of this international webinar on pediatric emergency is putting light on various pediatric emergencies in way different parts. So as a healthcare worker, we can prevent or treat the causes of death in sick children who are coming to the pediatric emergency department. So this is the part one of international webinar on pediatric emergencies. With this note, I would like to invite Ms. Gita Sinha, one of the academic council members of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses for welcome the gathering officially. Over to you, Ms. Gita. Thank you, Mr. Jaisal. Uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, a very good evening to each and everyone. And thank you so much to joining us on this webinar. On the behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, I welcome you all in this pediatric emergency webinar. I would, I would like to welcome our honorable chief guest, Dr. Rati Bala Chandran, and I also welcome to our other expert speaker. Before I hand over to Mr. Jessel, I just want to say one line. Already Jessel explained very well about the uh, death ratio of the pediatric patient. I just want to add maximum pediatric patient we receive in emergency department in India. Maximum are with the complaint of fever and followed by the diarrhea. The number of patients visiting in emergency department in India with the fever are 443 and the diarrhea cases are 290. So you can see, and all, all, all these conditions can uh, threaten the airway, can, uh, patient, may give, give, uh, patient may go into the shock. So these conditions can compromise the ABCD of the patient and we can we are losing losing the so many patients due to this condition which we can manage easily we have the excellent clinical nurses like NICO nurses our emergency nurses pediatric nurses so we have the excellent nurses in India with this uh, with the uh, educate skill so we can manage this patient easily we can save the patient's life we can save uh, the pediatric patient and we can save the children. 
so i just want to say one thing we can contribute in saving the life of the patients so please my lovely nurses i just want to add one line that is sky is the limit leave your comfort zone so uh, now i'm going to uh, hand over the session to mr uh, jaisal he is the coordinator of this uh, session thank you geeta for your welcome speech now we are moving to the official inauguration function of this webinar i am so glad to have a very special guest here to inaugurate this webinar today she doesn't need any introduction the dr reddy balajandran she is the chief guest of today's webinar so dr reddy balayandran she is the currently she has been working as a assistant director general nursing division government of india under ministry of health and family welfare since july 2015 she is also a faculty of indraprastha university new delhi india she has done her philo, uh, phd in nursing administration from in the nursing council and who consortium under rajiv gandhi university of health sciences and she has done a master in nursing that is in family practice nurse nursing in 2004 and 2006 and she has done her bsc nursing program from government college of nursing calicut it's my immense pleasure to invite dr reddy balajandran to inaugurate our session over to you ma'am very good evening to the resource persons and dear participants i'm am i audible yes ma'am you are audible ma'am yeah uh, because of the uh, issues in network i am keeping my video off and uh, before finishing i'll just put it open first of all let me congratulate the organizers for taking this topic and uh, organizing this webinar for uh, improving the competencies of nurses in pediatric emergencies and that to an international one as in the keynote address it has mentioned that the preventable deaths are very high in among children and child needs and requirements are different from adults and children are the precious gift of every family and when dealing with the pre children and that too emergency it is really stressful and a challenging i appreciate the contribution of every nurse in the emergencies especially dealing with pediatric emergency such webinars will give uh, bring the latest evidences and knowledge in the platform for nurses to update their their competencies and come out with better performance yes india is committed for the sustainable development goal and it is very much uh, uh, achieved if we join our hands together most of the complications what we face among newborns and infants can be prevented by having good antenatal care and all of you of us are aware about the government of published across the world providing quality and natal care in 2018 we have come out with the guidelines with an objective of having 86000 midwives across the country so that quality and natal postnatal and intranatal care can be provided and we can ensure that the child born is healthy even at the number of infant deaths and still death is still born and uh, infant deaths and the number of um, 
under five deaths are very high. It's, it can be prevented by empowering the family, especially mother, how, by how, how to take care of the child, especially in case of diarrhea, preventing infections, and also preventing poisoning, drowns, burns, falls. These common emergencies among children are these things which take life. Health has to be an individual's responsibility and together the family can be empowered to take care of the children and they can be prepared well both to have physically, mentally and uh, psychologically healthy baby. And I, at the same time, I will also, I am also well aware about the amount of stress made, faced by the nurses in the emergency, especially when dealing with the pediatric emergencies. To remain calm in such challenging phase is really a, a, a skill to be developed. I appreciate that and I also urge you to have de-stressing programs as well as the meditation and other relaxation techniques so that you will be taken care of by yourself because you are the precious resources available to be handled very carefully. So take care of yourself. And also to the nurse administrators to have good nurse bed ratio, nurse uh, children day ratio so that there will not be much stress. To the society, the society's responsibilities are also to take care of welfare of its members along with providing opportunities to update and contribute to the body of knowledge by bringing evidences across the world. So I, I urge you to work together for bringing such reforms and bring the international standards of nurse bed ratio in pediatric emergencies so that we can have a better working condition for the nurses in India. With these small words, I declare the of this webinar be inaugurated and uh, I wish you a great learning experience during this and request you to interact well and enrich yourself and utilize this in knowledge in your daily practice so that the, let our children benefit out of that and uh, be a healthy place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for your inspirational words and inaugurating this webinar. Next. Next, we are, without wasting much time, we are moving to the, the topic discussion of today's webinar. So first of all, I would like to introduce Ms. Ashley Hayes. So it's my pride and joy to invite Ms. Ashley Hayes to present the topic that is respiratory emergencies, airway obstructions in kids. About Ashlyn, she has been started her nursing career in 1995 with Tala University Hospital, Dublin. After that, she has done a diploma in children nursing from National Children's Hospital with Conjunction Trinity College of uh, Trinity College in Dublin. She is a certificate holder in healthcare management. She has also has certification in nurse and midwifery. Chris Graving. Currently, she has been pursuing masters in nursing and she has a vast clinical experience in neonatal step down unit diabetic care since 1999. Currently, she has been working with Tipperary University Hospital, County Tipperary, Dublin, sorry, uh, Ireland, as a senior registered nurse in pediatric emergency department and ward since 2007. It's my immense pleasure to have Ashley as an orator for this webinar. Over to you, Ashley. 
Um, hello, how are you? If you can hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Great. Get audible. Just, yeah, brilliant. One minute now, and I'll just share my screen. And it, um, I might just turn off my camera. Well, actually, I might not. It doesn't seem to want to work with me, so I'll keep it on for now. But if we're having difficulty or anything, I can um, I can stop the camera. Um, actually, I might just there. Lovely. So um, hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I suppose I'll give you just a quick little background on our ward. Um, it's a 15 bedded unit. It has, um, as Jessel already said, an emergency department. Um, there's a ward and then there's a day ward attached. Um, I suppose we're unique in that children come to us directly with medical emergencies um, and then trauma presentations go directly to the main emergency department. And occasionally we might be required to attend the main ED, particularly with regards to um, pediatric specific drug dosages and calculations. Um, we're probably quite different to a lot of hospitals, even in Ireland, because um, ambulances come directly to us with children. Um, so it kind of requires us to have a kind of specific set of skills, really, um, and also a little bit of dread and fear every now and then. Um, so I'm here specifically to speak about pediatric emergencies. Um, I'll refer mainly to the American Heart Association's Pediatric Advanced Life Support Guidelines. Um, I just want to say that I'm not a PALS trainer, but I am PALS certified, and I do have experience with lots of emergencies over the years. Um, I'd also recommend looking at a site called Don't Forget the Bubbles. Um, it's mainly directed at doctors, but it does have some really, really useful flow charts and up to date um, articles, um, all research based. And it's a collaboration between um, the UK and Australia. Um, and it's just they do a lot of training days as well. It's actually a very handy little one to follow. Um, I hope I don't overlap too much, but inevitably, I'm sure I will overlap with some of the next speakers. Um, so. Basically, I suppose it's important to remember that children can deteriorate rapidly and we have to keep that in mind when we always are dealing with children. Um, so when a child arrives at our emergency department, we first need to look at them, um, establish, does this look life threatening? Does it not? Obviously, if you think it's life threatening, you would call for help immediately. Um, obviously, if the heart rate's below 60 or if they're gasping or not breathing or no pulse, start CPR. Um, then what do you see? You're looking at their appearance, their breathing, their color. And I always remember being told as a student, like what you observe as a nurse, when you look at a child, that first impression is paramount. Um, and it can guide you straight away to where you go next. Um, also, it's important to use our pediatric assessment triangle. Um, so our pediatric assessment triangle um, comprises of three headings. You have your appearance, your work of breathing, and your circulation to skin. So when we talk about appearance, we're looking at the child's level of consciousness. Have they decreased interaction? Is their tone abnormal? Are they floppy? Um, when their parents are with them, are they consolable by their parents? Do they have an abnormal look or gaze? Are they staring? Is their speech normal? Is there a high-pitched cry or are they distractible? Um, the next part of our pediatric um, assessment triangle is the breathing part. So we listen for sounds that are audible without a stethoscope, um, such as grunting, strider, wheeze, is the child positioning themselves abnormally? Are they tripoding? Um, like I presume everyone knows what tripoding is, but just it's basically just sitting with their hand side beside their side, supporting themselves and bending over so much over their abdomen a little bit. Is the use of accessory muscles, um, such as subcostal recessions or tracheal tug? Are they seesaw breathing? Is every breath, is it going between their chest and their abdomen? Do they have nasal flaring or is there an absence of sounds? Is there gasping or is there no respiratory effort at all? The next stage then of our triangle is to assess the circulation by looking at the child's color. This can indicate how well a child is perfusing. 
and you can tell important information about their circulatory status by just looking at them and assessing this. So um, are there obvious signs of bleeding or trauma? Is the child pale? Are they mottled? Are they cyanotic? Are they flushed? Have they bruises? Have they a rash? Have they petechiae? Is there purpura? Um, I suppose I haven't mentioned this on one of my slides, but it's, I suppose it's important to remember that when you see something in a child, if you identify it, you treat it, or you intervene as, as, as much as you can, and then you're assessing again. So this cycle is an ongoing process throughout your assessment of the child. So the next stage then is your primary assessment. So you're talking about um, your A, B, C, D, E. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first you're looking at their airway. Um, is it open? Is it maintainable? Um, do they need intervention at this stage? Um, you're, to assess their airway for openness and patency, we look at the movement of the chest and the abdomen. And you listen for air movement and breath sounds, feel for the movement of air at the nose and mouth and scan the chest for rise and fall. You should not spend any more than 10 seconds doing this. Signs of airway obstruction are increased respiratory effort with retractions. Um, and abnormal inspiratory sounds such as snoring or a high pitched strider. And then episodes where there's no airway or breath sounds are present despite respiratory effort. So the child is really working hard to get that air in, but really they're not moving air at all. If the airway is obstructed, you have to determine then if it's open and can it be maintained by simple measures such as your chin lift, or do you need to look at advanced means of keeping the airway open? So some simple measures to keep your airway open are positioning, and this is hugely important. Um, having a child in a position that is comfortable for them and that the air is actually able to move. Um, then we look at your chin head tilt, chin lift or jaw thrust. Um, we may need to use suctioning just to help clear that airway. And there may, if it's a foreign, if you suspect a foreign body is in the airway, you need to look at maybe removing that foreign body. Um, again, possibly with suctioning or by means of um, a McGill's forceps or that, if it's obviously seen. And then you may require to use um, airway adjuncts such as your oropharyngeal airway. If you suspect that the airway is blocked, obviously you need to use your um, relief techniques such as your Heimlich maneuver if a child is over one, or if they're less than one, you're using your five back slaps and your five chest thrusts. Um, and I'll come back to this a little bit later on. So the next part of your assessment, the B for breathing, we need to assess the child's respiratory rate and pattern. Um, we must check for chest expansion and air movement and listen um, to the long airway sounds and check their oxygen saturations by means of pulse oximetry. So the next slide here just so shows the normal respiratory rates for children. And as you can see, there's a huge variation between ages. And I know people already know this, but it's just always a good reminder um, that your infants will have their rapid breathing. And this I was taken from the American Heart Association PALS guidelines. But I suppose um, in our world, we have our PUSE charts for our early warning scores. So you look at your local guidelines and what exactly is in their, their PUSE and local guidelines as well. So um, abnormal respiratory rate and pattern. Um, we're looking at something that, again, you could, you're trying to decipher, is it a neurological issue? Is it something else other than respiratory? Um, so such irregular patterns um, could be a gasping breath followed by an apnea or a rapid respiratory rate followed by periods of apnea or shallow breathing. This could signify impending arrest and is a serious and requires urgent intervention. Your fast respiratory rate is defined as a rate that is faster than normal for the child's age. And as we saw in the previous slide, that varies quite differently. Um, this fast rate could be accompanied by signs of increased effort. 
And if the rate is fast without increased effort, this may be as a result of conditions that are not primarily respiratory in origin, such as anemia, pyrexia, sepsis, or a congenital heart disease, or dehydration. And we had a little baby in to us last week who was grunting on assessment, but had no other respiratory symptoms, just was making a grunting sound. And the reason for this grunting was prolonged pyrexia associated with UTI. So I suppose it's important to be able to decipher whether it's something respiratory immediately or something that's not. Um, a slow respiratory rate or bradycardia may be caused by um, respiratory muscle fatigue, a CNS injury or problem, um, severe hypoxia, severe shock, hypothermia. Um, there's also the potential that their child has ingested some drugs that may um, depress the respiratory drive. Um, and then there are some muscle diseases that can cause a slow respiratory rate as well. Bradypnea along with an irregular respiratory pattern. Um, and this can be heard either on inspiration or expiration and is usually a sign of upper airway obstruction due to secretions or vomit or possibly blood, um, depending on, I suppose, the mechanism of why they've come to the department. Um, wheezing, I suppose this is quite commonly um, heard during, with children with respiratory issues. And this can be higher, low pitched. It's most often heard during expiration. And it's usually a sign of lower airway obstruction, especially in the smaller airways. Um, we listen for crackles. And these are sharp kind of crackling sounds usually heard on inspiration. You're listening for a change in the child's cry. And I know I've mentioned this already. Um, in a change in their speech and you're listening to see are they coughing and what that cough sounds like you're looking to see is a barking um, and also you would aim to keep a child's i mentioned pulse oximetry um, i suppose you're aiming with the guidelines to keep your oxygen levels uh, greater than or equal to 94 percent and if it's below this, you consider supplemental oxygen. Now, it's also important, though, to look here at a child's history. And I know we haven't gotten quite to that yet, but you don't want to over oxygenate if a child has a history of something cardiac. So it's just important to double check that before you go in there. So our C for circulation then relates um, to we're looking at for bradycardia, tachycardia and rhythm. Often tachycardia will occur when a child is struggling to maintain oxygenation. So you could look at a child who has normal oxygen saturations, but their heart rate is high and they're not pyrexial and you're wondering what's going on. Best to intervene and give them a little bit of oxygen and observe what that does to the heart rate in that moment. Also in children, it's important to note uh, that the heart rate in a healthy child can also fluctuate with their respiratory cycle. So again, this is an important difference between adults and children. It's important to palpate our pulses and assess them for strength and signs of hypovolemia. So this, I suppose, comes in, um, as your previous speakers mentioned, with situations like diarrhea, which is a common presentation in India. So it really is important to palpate your pulse and assess for strength. Um, also check capillary refill time. Um, we usually, well, I suppose the guidelines would recommend this is done centrally by pressing on a child's chest, counting slowly to five and then releasing and counting the time it takes for the blanching caused by that pressure exerted to return to their normal skill color. Um, when we're assessing a child's skin color, we're looking for mottling, pallor and cyanosis, which all indicate your inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. Have they a temperature? Are their peripheries cold, which is often a sign that they're centrally um, pyrexial. And it's just important to know, so we mentioned blood pressure, but blood pressure is always um, a late sign in children. And usually it, um, children can maintain their blood pressure for quite some time. So hypotension in a child is a late sign and it signifies impending arrest. So it needs immediate intervention. With relation to D for disability, you're looking at their assessments for neurological function, and this can reflect their brain perfusion. Is there enough oxygen and, and is their blood circulating properly to their brain? Um, so 
you look at their level of consciousness and uh, the mnemonic tickles is often used. So the T is for their muscle tone, I for interactiveness and are they able to interact with you and their parents? Are they consolable? And this is by their parents. Can their mum and dad or their carer um, calm them down when they're distressed? Are they staring? This is hugely important. Um, and it brings me back to a little girl that I looked after once who actually had meningitis, who was just staring at me. Um, also, their speech and cry, high pitched cry, as we know, is a sign of a neurological um, agitation. So it's always worth trying to find the cause of that. Um, so the next slide here just has signs of cerebral hypoxia. So the first lot of them are those that are sudden and severe. These happen very, very quickly. So you have your decreased level of consciousness, their loss of muscular tone, generalized seizures and pupil dilation. And you don't really get an awful lot of warning about those. Ones that are most likely to be seen um, during your assessment are more gradual hypoxia. So this would be your decreased level of consciousness. And this can be with or without confusion. Irritability, I've mentioned this a few times as the child consolable, it always comes back to this. Um, is a child lethargic and are they agitated? Um, and like sometimes a child will be agitated because they're just not getting enough oxygen through the brain. Your standard evaluations then for disability are your AVPU, your assessing for alertness, responsiveness to voice, yours or their parents. It's always useful to remember that they might not recognize your voice. So get their parents to speak to them. Um, are they responsive to pain um, or are they unresponsive? You also do a Glasgow Coma Scale, depending on age as well. Um, check for pupillary response to light and a blood glucose test. This is something that's often forgotten, but is hugely important for your pediatric patients who don't have the same reserve as an adult patient. So if a child presents with a history of vomiting, diarrhea, respiratory distress can you know, be present as well um, when their blood sugar is low or high. Um, so it really is important to evaluate this. I did look after a child once who came in in respiratory distress. We thought it was a respiratory issue because the GP had mentioned this to us. And at the door, they were there struggling to breathe, making a lot of noise. And actually what it turned out to be was diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, it's a really important investigation to do at point of care. And then your X E for exposure. This involves removing the child's clothing with consent if they're alert um, or with the parent's concert, consent. Looking at the skin, body and all extremities and examining them for potential um, physical injury. Is there bleeding? Is there rashes? It's hugely important to, to give them a good, as we call it, once over. Um, the next part then is your secondary assessment. So this involves looking at, um, it's more of a focused history or a focused examination. Um, and in this, you use the sample mnemonic. And this is looking at your signs and symptoms. What exactly are they presenting with? Have they any allergies to anything? Are they on any medications? Do they have a past medical history of a condition such as asthma? Um, when was their last meal? This can be often important when you're looking at maybe a foreign body airway obstruction. And were there any particular events that led up to this presentation? Um, a focused physical examination is then carried out. And I suppose specifically, as I'm here to discuss respiratory issues, when you're looking um, at it, respiratory distress, you need to evaluate the nose and mouth for signs of obstruction, nasal congestion, um, or for strider or mucosal oedema. Um, the chest and lungs are examined and the heart is assessed for tachycardia. Is there gallop or is there a murmur? And I know our medical colleagues are going to look at this, but when you're in an emergency situation and a lot of our nursing colleagues are well used to listening to these chest sounds. So again, it's good to listen and it's also good to have someone else to give a second opinion as well. Um, you're listening for... Um, Again, assessing the child's level of consciousness. This is hugely important. And this is all assessed frequently throughout their assessment. Um, and then ongoing assessment is essential throughout the whole, from every interaction with this child when they present to you. It helps evaluate the response to treatment and track any progression 
of identified problems. Um, and these elements are ongoing throughout it. So they involve your pediatric assessment triangle, your ABCDE, your assessment again of your anatomical and physical findings. This is coming back to your focused um, assessment. And then you're rev all the time reviewing the effectiveness of the interventions. When you intervene, you go back and reassess to see if what you've done has actually helped or made the child worse. Um, the following are some diagnostic assessments that you would use um, in relation to assessing a child in respiratory distress. So I suppose it depends on um, what you have locally, but we generally, um, it says, I suppose, in the guidelines to do at, to look at artillery blood gas or VBG. We most you usually use VBG. Um, I suppose in neonatal units, they tend to use the capillary blood gases quite often. We do a lactate when we're doing the gas. Um, and this is particularly if you suspect sepsis. There may be a requirement to do a chest X-ray, an ECG, um, and a peak flow. Um, often when a child is quite well, you kind of don't do the peak flow that often, um, but it's still recommended as one of the things that you would do. I suppose it's important to note that you don't wait to do these investigations. When you find a problem, you treat it. Um, or the investigation part can wait because you need to deal with exactly what's presenting before you. So the types and severity of potential problems in children um, can be classified into upper airway obstruction, lower airway obstruction, lung tissue disease and disordered control of breathing. And these then can vary in severity um, from respiratory distress to respiratory failure. Um, so upper airway obstruction is that that usually occurs outside the thorax. So this means um, it usually involves either the nose, pharynx or larynx. Uh, it can be mild to severe. Um, and usually typical causes of this type of obstruction are foreign body obstruction, infection, swelling of the airway, anaphylaxis, croup, epiglottitis, um, tonsillar hypertrophy. There can be a mass, um, such an, as an abscess or a tumor. Secretions can also obstruct the airway. And there then can be maybe a congenital airway abnormality, such as a subglottic stenosis or something like that. Your signs of upper airway obstruction are increased respiratory rate, um, increased inspiratory respiratory effort. So they're trying to get that air in, but they just are having difficulty doing it. There can be strider, a change in the child's voice. They might often um, have drooling, snoring, or gurgling sounds, and they'll have poor chest rise because that upper airway obstruction is just stopping the air getting into the lungs. And that again can be heard on auscultation. Typical management of your airway obstruction you allow the child to assume a position of comfort. Often a child will show us what works for them. So this is again where you kind of see that tripoding. Um, that's them trying to get comfortable to get the air in. Um, you may need to perform manual airway maneuvers such as your jaw thrust, head tilt and chin lift. Um, we had, I suppose he was more of an adult recently and it was, he kept obstructing his upper airway for us one night. Um, and for us, it was such a simple thing. And I wish I thought of it probably a little bit sooner than I should have. But just that change of positioning and just holding the jaw trust chin tilt or head tilt chin lift position actually helped us to open his airway, helped this boy to relax, allowed oxygenation and his agitation settled. And it was absolutely amazing. And once he relaxed more, he was actually able to maintain his own way after that. So this is a really simple measure to use. Um, also, the removal of that foreign body. Um, obviously, if you see something that can be removed, you try to remove it. Um, suctioning of the nose and mouth, um, again, is quite important. If you think that there is something that can be suctioned out um, to do this, you reduce that air if you think there is upper airway swelling um, with medication. You try to minimize the child's agitation, you know, by means of relaxing them, have the parent with them. Again, oxygen um, for agitation is hugely important. You may need an oropharyngeal airway. 
And obviously then if it's severe upper airway obstruction, you'd be looking at, I suppose, preparing for a surgical airway. Um, hopefully this isn't something that occurs too often, but we always have to be prepared. Some of the common presentations um, with upper airway obstruction that we would see would be croup, anaphylaxis, and your foreign body airway obstruction. For us in our departments, our foreign body airway obstructions would usually go to the main ED, but we are a pediatric ward, so a child can obstruct at any stage, um, so you may be required to intervene. Um, for croup, um, it can again vary from mild to impending arrest really. Um, for your mild croup, you may have an occasional barking cough. There may be little or no strider, um, or there can be absent sounds or mild retractions. For a more moderate croup presentation, you have frequent barking cough, um, an easily audible strider at rest, retractions at rest. Um, sometimes there can be agitation, but it's rare enough at this stage and um, because they're still maintaining their airway and they still have good air entry and usually their oxygen saturations are maintainable. Um, then where you have a severe croup, you would have a frequent barking cough. You would have a prominent inspiratory um, strider and very occasionally an expiratory strider. It's, I suppose I haven't really seen this too much. It's usually on inspiration. Um, there would be marked retractions. And usually with croup, you see a marked tracheal tug. They're sucking in hard to try and get that air in. Um, they'd be agitated. And this is because they're working hard. Um, there may be impaired oxygenation. So they don't like intervention. And you will also notice the career entry, air entry on auscultation. And then where you have your impending um, respiratory failure, your barking cough, is probably absent, um, but it can be there. Um, there'll be a strider when they're at rest. So they're lying there and you're hearing that loud strider. They may have their retractions. They'll have poor air movement on auscultation. They'll be lethargic. Um, they'll have a decreased level of consciousness. They'll be pale. And even though you're giving them oxygen, they'll be cyanotic despite this. Um, so our management of croup then, for a mild croup, um, you'd consider giving them dexamethasone, and this is usually 150 micrograms per kilogram, or nebulized bedesonide. Um, and this is, a, I suppose, a stat dose of two milligrams, and it's given across the board. Two milligrams is given to all ages and sizes. For In our department, we tend to give both, um, and I think it's just that we want to treat it and we don't want it to escalate to impending failure. Um, so we find that most of our children, we immediately give them their budesonide nebulizer, and then we follow that up immediately with their dexamethasone. Um, for a moderate to severe croup, um, we would give humidified oxygen. Um, we would keep them nil by mouth. Um, you would give them nebulized um, epinephrine or adrenaline. Um, and you would observe them for about two hours for improvement. If you're giving nebulized adrenaline, you need to put them on cardiac leads um, just to monitor for any changes there. And you would also then give them their dexamethasone 150 micrograms per kilogram. Then where you suspect impending failure, um, they need high concentration oxygen via a non-rebreather mask. Um, you may need to consider bag mask ventilation if there's persistent severe hypoxia. Um, you obviously they wouldn't be able to tolerate orally, so you would go for IV or IM dexamethasone, and you again would be prepared for intubation or a surgical airway. Um, for anaphylaxis, again, this can be mild to severe. Um, and I suppose where it's mild, the guidelines would tell us to remove the offending agent. What is causing the allergy in the first place, if it can be removed? Um, it's not always possible to do that, particularly if they've ingested something. Get help immediately. Don't wait um, for the condition to deteriorate. Check their history. This comes back to your sample assessment. Are they allergic to something? Have they had an anaphylaxis in the past? And do they wear an allergy bracelet? 
And for mild anaphylaxis, you'd consider um, an oral antihistamine. I suppose we commonly use um, some pyrrhotin or um, cetirizine um, in our department, depending on the age of the child and the severity, I suppose, really. But pyrrhotin is probably the most common used one. Um, and the Zyrtec then would be used if it's a very, very mild reaction because it's a little bit slower action. Um, for moderate to severe, then anaphylaxis, you're looking at giving them IM, epinephrine, and we have the auto injectors on our emergency trolley, and we also have them on a phylax and an excuse me anaphylaxis tray, um, which we keep nearby, um, and this can be given every ten to fifteen minutes as needed. We would then give them IV corticosteroids. You need to treat the bronchospasm if it's present, then with a bronchodilator such as salbutamol, and this can be given depending on um, the severity of the child's condition either via an inhaler or nebulized salbutamol. If they're in very severe anaphylaxis, you may need to consider um, continuous nebulization. And then if they have hypertension, which as we said earlier, is a very late stage and um, signifies a pen impending arrest, you would need to treat it immediately with a 20 mil per kilogram bolus of normal saline. Um, when it comes to our foreign body obstruction, again, it can be mild to severe or to unresponsive, really. Um, and so we would look at, again, call for help immediately. You're really not expected to do this alone. Um, try If the patient is able, try and get them to clear that airway themselves with coughing, because if they're able to cough, they're not fully obstructed. Um, then if you have severe um, foreign body obstruction, there's no sound. The person can't speak they're gesturing to show you that they're um, obstructed. There may be a high pitch sound on inspiration. There'd be poor ex air exchange and there may be no noise at all. So this needs obviously immediate intervention. And as I said earlier, if a child is less than one, you give their five back slaps, five chest thrusts, and you repeat this until the foreign body is expelled or the child becomes unresponsive. If they're unresponsive, you start CPR. If a child is greater than one up to the age of adolescence, you would give the Heimlich maneuver until the object is expelled, or again, if they become unresponsive. And as I said there, if they're unresponsive, you start CPR immediately. And every time then you go to do a breath, you check them out to see has that foreign body moved? Has it been expelled? Um, and only try to remove that object if it's visible, because if you go trying to do it um, when you can't see it, you will cause more upper airway tissue damage. Um, so only remove it, it can be removed easily. So then our lower airway obstruction then um, refer usually involves the bronchi and bronchioles, and this occurs typically inside the thorax. Um, common presentations in our department really are bronchiolitis and asthma. Um, and I suppose your first priority with all of these conditions, conditions is to restore oxygenation. Bronchiolitis for us is very common, particularly in our winter months, as is croup and the cold temperatures in Ireland, we see these most commonly, I suppose. Um, and it occurs from usually September, October to February, we kind of see most of it. Um, and it's kind of characterized by inflammation um, and mucus building up in the bronchioles that babies with their small airways struggle to clear. Um, so keeping their nose clear is essential as these babies, because they're habitual nose breathers up until six months, just can't breathe through their mouths automatically. So this nose, keeping this nose clear, it's basic and simple, but it is essential. Um, so for management of our bronchiolitis, we're talking about minimal handling and cluster care. They need to rest in between. Um, so kind of plan your interventions and care. Um, kind of do it all. Go in, do your bits and leave. <laughs> so we say position. And I have this in capitals because there's nothing worse than going in and finding a child in respiratory distress lying flat on a bed. Support them keep them upright, do that if you need to with pillows or whatever means you have of supporting them. They mo usually need supplemental oxygen and often with these little ones of bronchiolitis, it might be the tiniest amount of oxygen. Um, and we usually give it via nasal cannulae. But if 
they are still struggling and have severe respiratory distress or are head bobbing, um, you would consider high flow nasal cannula oxygen. Um, we have used this quite a lot this year. Um, and we kind of have started using it a little bit sooner than we normally would have. Our guidelines tell us try nasal cannula oxygen first, and if there is no improvement, then go to the high flow nasal cannula. Um, we find use we find I suppose using it this year that it's prevented our children becoming more distressed, and it's just that you're giving more heated oxygen and a little bit of pressure. Um, so that they're not struggling quite as hard. And you can actually see the relief on a baby's face when you start them on high flow nasal cannula oxygen, as opposed to normal humidified oxygen when they're in that distress. Um, you may also need to consider restricting their feeding if they're in severe distress because they're just not able to cope with feeding. Often we place a nasogastric tube and feed them that way if we don't have IV access. Um, if we do, we would put them on fluids it's kind of hard, I suppose, a small baby is going to cry when they're hungry. So sometimes you have to balance out giving them a little bit of feed and keeping them on IV fluids or splitting both um, just enough that you don't cause them severe distress. Um, normal saline nibs then we use quite frequently um, and the saline just helps um, act as an irritant to clear that airway and helps them cough up the mucus. 3% saline nebs, um, which is also known as hypertonic saline, um, are also given. A lot of people don't like these because they feel that children go into a spasmodic coughing when they have them. Um, so you'll find us going for a 0.9% nebulizer first. Um, just I suppose it's a little safety thing that some of us, um, maybe there's that fear of causing more distress in a child. Often we use um, iprotropium bromide nebulizers as well. Um, and we usually give them six to eight hourly in the little ones. Um, and obviously it's all waste, um, weight based. Um, and occasionally we have used Lasix in these babies. If, and this is usually a consultant that would recommend this if they listen and they think those lungs are particularly wet, um, then they might just do a stat of Lasix. They wouldn't go on it um, frequently. This chart is just um, from a piece of research done by um, one of the contributors to the Don't Forget the Bubbles. Um, and on it there, you can see um, it's a flow chart for the high flow nasal cannula. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of the chart, there is the weight based starting points. Um, and again, depending on their age, but each unit will have its own policy based on their research anyway. But this is just a handy, quick flow chart um, for that. So then our next lower airway obstruction that we see quite commonly is asthma. Um, and again, this um, can be mild to severe. Um, and it usually the management of it requires giving humidified oxygen via a mask or nasal cannula and titrate this oxygen um, to give you sacs of greater than 94%. You would give salbutamol by a metered dose inhaler or by nebulizer. And again, if it's mild, you probably can manage with the salbutamol inhaler following um, asthma guidelines. Um, and usually for our children, um, you know, they're taught this on discharge if they have a diagnosis of asthma. Um, but I think there's always that fear that they're going to get worse at home. So they often present to us. Um, and we again, depending on the severity, often give what we call back-to-back -back, um, nebulizers. So we would give salbutamol and ipratropium bromide together if we're giving nebulizers. Um, we'd also pop them on an oral corticosteroid if it's mild to moderate, because they can usually tolerate the oral. If you have moderate to severe asthma, you're looking at high concentration oxygen via non-rebreather mask, because as we said earlier, it's essential to restore their oxygenation um, because this settles down all your other systems. It stops their agitation, it reduces tachycardia. As I said, we would give salbutamol and ipratropium bromide nebulizers. And when I mention the back-to-back, -back, what we usually do is give three, um, three nebulizers of the salbutamol and atrovent um, and usually about 20 minutes apart. Um, depending on the severity, sometimes you would just go in there quickly and give it once they're finished one, maybe give them five minutes and give the next one. Um, you may need to establish intravenous access. 
and corticosteroids again um you would either give them iv or po depending on where they are on the scale of severity and whether their venous axis um is good or not um also then in severe asthma you would consider giving magnesium sulfate and this is given as a bolus and it's important then to monitor the heart rate and blood pressure when doing this and then you would look at blood gases and chest chest x-ray as required um in acute asthma um where there is impending respiratory failure again you give your oxygen via non-rebreather mask you may at this situation look at con giving continuous salbutamol your corticosteroid again and in this situation you might consider uh, intravenous aminophilin infusion um, and this is continuous this needs to be monitored for toxicity so you're using levels and if you're putting a child on something like this you need to consider cardiac monitoring as well um cpap is recommended in the guidelines um in our department we actually don't use cpap locally so if a child is in severe distress that you're considering um cpap where we are we would be looking at um our icu team so we'd be contacting they're called the opats where we are so you would be getting specialist um help at that stage you don't wait obviously to do we would probably go for et intubation um, and get that child out to an ICU department. Um, high flow nasal cannula isn't really recommended in asthma management um, because it can make bronchospasm worse. Um, but we have used it um, when we've just struggled to get that child settled before that stage of CPAP or ET intubation. Um, for lung tissue disease, then this can be caused by things like your infectious pneumonia a chemical pneumonitis, um, aspiration pneumonia, cardiogenic oedema, and your non-cardiogenic pulmonary oedema, such as ARDS. Um, so for your management of um, infectious pneumonia, you're looking at diagnostic assessments. Now, this is all, again, in relation to your, the assessments I mentioned earlier. These are specific to your infectious pneumonia. Um, you're looking at doing a blood gas, chest X-ray for diagnosis um viral studies um and we do often an extended viral screen on a lot of our children just to see what is the causative um organism of all of these things you do a full blood count um blood culture and often a sputum um again we tend to do this more in bronchiolitis um because children tend to swallow the sputum they're not really great at coughing it up and spitting it out i suppose um antibiotics then would be given um ideally within the first hour of contact. If they're wheezy, you give a salbutamol by inhaler or nebulizer. Um, you would consider your high flow nasal cannula oxygen if your normal oxygen, um, humidified oxygen wasn't working. And then you need to treat your fever. This will help reduce your work of breathing. And it's so important if you find a child has a temperature at any stage during your assessment, treat that temperature because that will help them reduce that work of breathing. Um, for your management then of your chemical um, pneumonias, your causes of these are usually an inhalation um, or aspiration of toxic liquids or gases or dust. Um, so you treat your wheeze with a bronchodilator. You may need to consider CPAP or ventilation depending on the severity. And again, for us, this is looking for outside intervention um, because we don't have ICU. We're not a pediatric hospital. We're a tertiary hospital. So we would be looking at getting them transferred as quick as possible. And I suppose I would always say if you think there's a risk of a child deteriorating while en route to that center, you need to consider each T-tube intubation before you leave because you do not want them deteriorating en route because you're in trouble then. Um, on the side of the road is not the best place for, for intubation. Um, so get that early care um, and specialist care early in, in uh, your management. And then aspiration pneumonia. Um, we do sometimes see this in our department, actually, um, most usually in children with additional needs um, who may have swallow issues or are on nasogastric feeding at home. Um, and it's caused by toxic effects of um, oral secretions that are aspirated or often stomach acid. Um, and it's basically then the subsequent inflammatory response of inhaling these things. 
Um, so for this, we usually treat it with a high flow nasal cannula. Um, we would get it in quite early in children like this. Um, and then CPAP or ventilation if they continue to work or continue to deteriorate on the high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And then we would also treat them with antibiotics. Um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we see this, I suppose, a little bit less. And I'm sure the speakers who are speaking about the cardiology stuff may go into these a little bit more. Um, but the causes of this is usually high pressure in the pulmonary capillaries, um, which causes fluid to leak into the lung interstitium and the alveoli. And it's usually, you'd see it in left ventricular uh, myocardial dysfunction, such as congenital heart disease, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, um, maybe an inflammatory process where there is um, inflammation of the heart caused by a particular um, disease, hypoxia, um, and some cardiac depressant drugs such as beta blockers, um, antidepressants, and calcium channel blockers. Um, management, in addition to the measures um, mentioned previously, is ventilation support. So this might be mechanical ventilation or your CPAP. You might need diuretics, inotropes, and always expert advice, um, particularly if you're not a specialist hospital. Um, and again, it comes back to keeping the temperature normal to reduce your metabolic demand. So I know we always say temperature is a normal occurrence in children, but when a child is severely sick, getting that temperature down will decrease um, their metabolic demand. Um, then where you have your non-cardiogenic um, oedema, your, which is usually ARDS, um, and this is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and this usually follows pneumonia or aspiration um, or a systemic sepsis. So generally they have been in hospital and they are being treated. They don't, or there's been a history of, you know, being unwell and having infection. It doesn't, they don't usually present with it, I suppose, unless they've had an illness prior to this. Um, your interventions, again, are, as we previously stated, but you also need to monitor their heart rate, blood pressure, um, respiratory rate, oxygen saturations, and their end tidal CO2. Um, usually they're intubated if you're monitoring end tidal CO2. You're checking blood gas, you're doing a full blood count. And as I said, ventilation if needed, if there's a worsening X-ray or their clinical condition is deteriorating. Um, conditions then when we look at our disordered control of breathing as one of our causes of distress, um, this is usually caused by increased intracranial pressure. Um, so if they have a head injury or a tumor or something that's causing um, an increase in their, their pressure, if they have a neuromuscular disease or if they have um, been poisoned or they have a drug ingestion. Um, I suppose the common causes that you, we see of increased intracranial pressure are meningitis, um, encephalitis, and intracranial abscess. I put a little star by this because I did look after a girl once um, who was deteriorating before her eyes, and it was very hard to pinpoint what was going on with her. She did have a history of a headache and sinusitis, but it turned out she had an intracranial abscess, and it was her respiratory rate that actually alerted all the staff to there was something serious going on. Her heart rate also, um, I think it dipped in this little girl, um, which was unusual. A subarachnoid hemorrhage um, can also be a cause. Um, a subdural epidural hematoma, traumatic brain injury, hypoxia or an ischemic insult, hydrocephalus or a tumor. Hi, Ashley. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, could you please uh, wind, uh, wind the session? Why? Because you are just closing the time, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, I'm nearly yeah. there, Ivan. About yeah. two minutes and I'll be finished. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jessel. Um, So management of disordered breathing due to our increased intracranial pressure. Um, you, If it's a trauma, you manage the airway, um, keep the head midline, open that airway and stabilize your C-spine. You give oxygen. Um, if there's poor perfusion or evidence of organ failure, give air bolus um, of normal saline usually is what we would give. Um, you may need to give pharmacological agents to reduce the intracranial pressure, such as mannitol or steroids. Treat their agitation and give pain relief once their airway is established and their ventilation is adequate. And again, avoid fever. I know I keep mentioning this. 
Um, poisoning, you would contact your poison center, have suction ready in case they vomit. If there's an antidote to the toxin that they've taken in, such as naloxone for opioid overdose, give that. Um, again, your diagnostic assessments and just, I suppose the different one here is to check a urine um, or blood for toxicology and prepare for transfer as necessary. So this is just a quick flow chart of respiratory emergency. So this is one that's, um, you'll find very easily, it's won by the American Heart Association in their PALS guidelines. And it's a quick, quick guideline. It's a useful a logarithm to have on site. Um, and just to close, um, oxygen saves your life right now, to quote Dr. Mike Ryan. And I know he was talking like there a couple of weeks ago with regards to getting oxygen to people in Ukraine, but oxygen is life-saving. So if you can't get your oxygen to your patient, then you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> and here is just a, a list of references. And I'd like to thank you so much for your time and um, wish you a, a good um, and enjoyable day for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashlyn. Thank you for your informative session. And you have covered all the aspects of respiratory emergencies and you have uh, very deeply explained the airway obstructions in kids with the signs and symptoms and the management part you very nicely explained. Thank you for your informative session. So I'm very, very happy to see that in our YouTube live, more than 1200 participants are watching this live program. So this is a time. So actually we have received some questions from the side of participants. So I'm again telling you people, the participants, please make this session interactive. We can throw more questions. So because of you only the session can be interactive. So please design the session very carefully, throw your questions. We are ready to answer your queries. So we have some questions, Ashton. There's a question asked by Anaga Aji. Her question was, which site is the most accurate for assessing pulse in infants? A, a site, is it, or? Yeah, um, a site is. Like the American Heart Association, I suppose, guidelines um, are probably what we would refer to most um, usually. Um, and their site for the American Heart Association is quite good. And now they would have the guidelines on it. And often in your workplace, um, you would have access to more information directly from them um, through institutes as well. You know, if anyone is studying, you might be able to access them as well. The Don't Forget the Bubbles is very good, though. I really like that site. Um, and they do a lot of webinars and updates um, with regards to your, I suppose, they, they had a lot this year because it was a particularly bad bronchiolitis season. So there was a huge amount of updates on bronchiolitis um, via them. So I don't know if that quite answers the question, but um, yeah, they would be the best ones for recommended for guidelines on assessment really of, of a, a child in respiratory distress. Yes. Thank you, Ashley. So usually we can use the infants for assessing the pulse. The brachial pulse mm -hmm. is the most, the good pulse we yes. can use for yes. assessing the infants. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Ashley. Sorry, so I, next... mis I obviously misunderstood that question. <laughs> no bother, no bother. Oh, yeah. Okay, next question asked by Sapna Pal. Her question is, in neonate, till which range respiratory rate considered abnormal? In a neonate. Um, yeah. So above 60, really. I mean, you're, if a child, if a neonate is above 60, um, you're, you're looking that they are in distress, you know, that kind of way. Um, you're talking 60 to 80 is severe, is respiratory distress in a neonate. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. And an another question asked by Wansha. Her question is how to perform manual airway manual? Airway manual. Maneuver. The, the manual airway maneuvers. So you're literally lifting 
your their jaw chin you don't want to overextend in a small baby so you just put a small baby in a sniffing position so like they're sniffing <laughs> you know like to smell something so you don't want to overextend because you'll occlude in a neonate but for your airway manual airway maneuvers your jaw trust chin lift as you're taught in your basic cpr really um, and just maintaining that position for them to keep the airway open yeah mm. hope she answers the question so next question asked by anaga again can we administer nebulization using only normal saline to loosen the secretion in child yep yeah you can yeah it is and it's commonly used um saline is an irritant to the airway so if you think that there is um mucus blocking the airway that you can't see or remove with suction and that they're coughing I suppose that they're having difficulty coughing or having spasmodic coughing that they need to clear it. You can use, we usually give about two mils of um, about 9% normal saline. Um, and it just acts as an irritant and helps them to clear it. Do you know, it's not doing anything else other than an irritant to clear the airway. Um, really, that's kind of, it's medicinal purpose, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Ashley. Yep. So next question asked by Pramod. Rathod, his question is role of dexo, dexamethasone in group. Yeah. What is so, the role of dexamethasone in group? Yeah. It's it's anti-inflammatory. So you're looking at reducing um, in group your upper airway swelling. So you're trying to get that swelling down so that the and it's more for like it's not going to do it immediately. Um, that's when we give you your bedesonide, really, because that will have more of an immediate effect or epinephrine if they're in severe failure. What your dexamethasone, I suppose, um, reduces that airway inflammation. And because it's more prolonged um, and its action is about 12 hours, I think, in total, it'll last for, um, it just reduces that airway and keeps the inflammation down so that they don't become more obstructed. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley. Another question asked by Eva Lavrin. Her question is, why we have to monitor heart rate and blood pressure during magnesium sulfate infusion? I suppose you're looking at it in case of arrhythmia um, with magnesium sulfate um, is really what you're looking for um, as a side effect of the mag sulfate, if you can at all. Um, now, it doesn't have to be, I don't think we necessarily use telemetry. We use that really for um, a monophylline infusion, but it is a good idea to keep an eye on your blood rate and heart rate for changes. Um, and just in case of toxicity as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ashton. These are all the questions uh, through by the yeah. participants yeah. for this session. And uh, once again, thank you for your informative session. That's great. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So again, uh, my request to the participants, please uh, watch the video uh, completely and uh, throw your questions. And uh, I would like to tell one thing that after the end of the session, you will get the post test. And uh, once you complete the post, and post test, then only you will be awarded with the certificate. And the most important thing, the post test link will be active immediately after the completion of this webinar, but this link will be active only for 24 hours. I'm repeating again, you will get the post test link in the chat box immediately after the completion of this webinar. However, the link would be active only for 24 hours. I repeat, the link would be active only for 24 hours. And for the posters, to get the certificate, you should get the minimum of 70 percentage mark for your posters. That means we have arranged 30 questions in the posters in that you should answer, you should make correct answer for at least 23 questions, then only you will be awarded with certificate from the side of society. So don't forget to get the uh, 
uh, post do the posters and at the same time you should do the posters in, within 24 hours you could do repeated attempt to get the poster score but the link would be active only for 24 hours and another important thing i would like to convey you that while you are filling the google form of the post test you should be very aware to fill your name and the email id without any spelling mistake so you should be keep it yourself the i should be open yourself and to fill the email id and the name in caps letter without spelling mistake because it may make the further delay in getting the certificate so so participants please watch the webinar completely then only you can you will you can uh, get a you will get a good mark for the posters so next we are moving to the another topic of today's webinar for that i would like to welcome i would like to invite miss jisha wogis she has she did her bs nursing program from sme lc medical institution cochin kerala after that she has worked in ctvs department for one year and also she had, she had worked as an assistant lecturer in st joseph college of nursing ernakulam then since 2005 she has, has been working as a staff nurse in government medical college in Kottayam and as an in-service education program, she has joined for the MSc nursing in pediatric nursing from the Government College of Nursing Calicut during the year 2009 and 2011. After that, she has worked as an assistant professor in Nirmala College of Nursing for five years. Now, she has been working as a Chief Coordinator of Clinical Nursing Education Unit at Government Medical College, Kottayam, since 2018. I would like to invite Jisha to present the topic on neurological emergencies. And her, the topic is, are all seizures an emergency? Over to Jisha. Thank you, Chesel, for your nice words about me. In today's webinar, I'm interested to speak on pediatric emergencies. Uh, sorry, in, the, uh, pediat in this webinar of pediatric emergencies, I'm interested to speak on the aspects of neurological emergency, that is, are all seizures are an emergency? So before moving to the exact topic, let us see some basics regarding the seizures. Let me share my slide. Actually, I have a problem with my video. That's why I have. Hope, is it visible? Yes, Disha. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we can move on to the topic, the seizure, whether it is a neurological emergency or not. First about the seizure. As we all know, seizures are certain abnormal electrical discharges from the brain that results in the changes in sensation, behavior, movements, perception, or consciousness. A seizure results when a certain imbalance occurs between the excitatory and the inhibitory forces within the network of the cortical neurons in favor of certain onset net excitation. And usually we, we, ex, we have experienced that there may be many problems behind the seizures. These include high fever, brain infections, abnormal sodium or blood sugar levels, or even head injury, or sometimes reason behind it may be an epileptic cases. So while uh, we, may, we may have a confusion regarding whether all the seizures are an epilepsy. Actually, an isolated single seizure does not constitute an epilepsy. In order to call it as an epilepsy, there should be a persistent epileptogenic abnormality of the brain that is able to spontaneously generate paroxysmal activity. 
So in epilepsy, there are the recurrent seizures that may be two or more, which are not provoked by systemic or acute neurological enzymes. Then another concern behind is this, not everything that looks like a seizure is a seizure. That's in the emergency room or in the critical care unit, we may have experienced different seizure outbreaks. And in that case, sometimes, sometimes syncop, psychogenic seizure or a behavioral outburst or a breath holding spell, takes or sleep disorders may mimic a seizure. So we should be very careful while assessing the child and taking the history of the child, whether this is actually a seizure or not, and then only really intervene with the anti-seizure medications. And just we can see what are the types of seizures. The seizures are broadly classified as generalized seizures and the focal seizures. And in generalized seizures, there will be it affects both sides of the brain. And there are four types: the tonic-clonic, absence, myoclonic, or an tonic seizure. And sometimes this tonic-clonic again it can be divided as a tonic seizure or a clonic seizure too. Then the focal seizure. These are located, these are started from a fossae that is located in just one area of the brain and that may be classified as a simple partial seizure or a complex partial seizure. Then about the generalized seizure. In generalized seizures, the aberrant electrical discharge diffusely involves the entire cortex of both the hemispheres from the onset and the consciousness is usually lost. Generalized seizures result most often from metabolic disorder and sometimes from some genetic disorders. Then looking into the types, first is tonic-clonic seizure that may be otherwise known as a grand mal seizure. And here the child or a person who are experiencing may, find, uh, may have muscle jerks or spasms, he may cry out, he may lose the consciousness or fall into the ground. Then the second entity is absent seizure. It is otherwise known as petit mal seizure. This, is us this usually involves a brief sudden lapses of attention in children, and it can cause rapid blinking or lip smacking, or sometimes seconds of staring into the space. And this type of seizure, that is absent seizures, are more common in children than, than in adults. Then about the myoclonic seizures. These are characterized by brief jerking spasms of the muscles or muscle group often occurs with, this is often associated with atonic seizures and when causes sudden muscle limpness. Then the last type, atonic recanitic seizure, it is otherwise known as drop seizures too. These are the type of seizures that causes sudden loss of muscle strength. Then moving to the focal seizures. Of the from the name itself, it, is, uh, it pertains out, it originates from a single focus. It is otherwise known as a partial seizure too. In the partial seizure, the excess neuronal discharge occurs in one cerebral cortex and most often result from structural abnormalities. And the way the child acts during a focal seizure depends on the area of the brain that is affected. We all know that the rights of the right side of the brain controls left side of the body. Therefore, a seizure involving the right side of the brain will affect the left side of the body and vice versa. And there are two types of focal seizures. These are simple partial or simple focal or a complex partial. In case of simple partial seizure, it do not involve a loss of consciousness for the uh, victim. That is, if it is a child, he may be able to remember and able to describe what has happened during the seizure. But in case of a complex partial seizure, the person lost the consciousness and do not remember the seizure after it is over. Then another common entity in this pediatric age group which causes uh, seizure is febrile seizures. We, we all are familiar regarding this febrile seizure. This, as the name implies, this seizure is associated with a febrile illness. That is, this febrile seizure occurs up to three to four percentage of all children under five years of age. And this is usually com uh, occurred, occur commonly during viral than bacterial infection, as study says, and the males are more commonly affected. 
Then regarding the definition of the febrile seizure, we should be able to differentiate a febrile seizure and a pathogenic seizure when we are in the critical care unit or in this emergency department because the management options and the further, uh, further management options and the late management options may differ. Now, if it is a febrile convulsion, it's a convulsion in a child between six months and six years of age in the setting of an acute febrile illness, without prior febrile seizures or significant prior neurological abnormality and no CNS infection. So from this, it is clear that in order to include a seizure as febrile origin, we, they should satisfy the, follow, uh, the following criteria. The child should fall within the typical age range of six months to six years and must be developmentally normal for the age and must not have had prior febrile seizures. And this episode of seizure must have related to a fever more than 30 degree Fahrenheit in association with the seizure. And um, majority of children have the febrile seizures on the first day of the illness. And in some cases, the seizure is the first manifestation that the child is ill. Then there are two types of febrile seizures. There's a simple febrile seizure, a typical febrile seizure, or a complex or atypical febrile seizure. In order to say it as a simple febrile seizure, the seizure should be of generalized tonic-clonic type, lasting less than 15 minutes, and should not recur within the same febrile illness. But there are focal features at onset or during the seizure, and duration is more than 15 minutes, or it recurs within the same febrile illness, then it is denoted as a complex or a typical seizure, febrile seizure. And the most important fact behind the seizure in childhood is that most seizures in the childhood stop within five minutes of starting. After the five minutes, the likelihood of a seizure will stop on its own precipitously drops. And the treatment should start if the seizure has not spontaneously terminated after five minutes. And we should always remember that seizure of longer duration are more difficult to terminate and may be associated with neurological sequelae. Now, moving to the first or topic question, are all seizures or emergency? So with this presentation, we may have seen that there are different types of seizures and how it is being presented. And it is clear that all seizures are not an emergency, but there may be an emergency that is a real emergency that is called a status epilepticus. This status epilepticus is very rare as condition is more common in young children and elderly adults. And usually in the young children, prolonged febrile seizure is the most common cause of, cause of this status epilepticus. And the pediatric convulsive status epilepticus is the most common neurological emergency in the childhood. Now we can just see what is a status epilepticus. The duration of continuous activity used to define status epilepticus has varied over the time. Traditionally, status epilepticus is defined as continuous or repetitive seizure activity persisting for at least 30 minutes without recovery of consciousness between the attacks. And from this uh, definition, it is clear that because of the clear clinical urgency in treating a generalized convulsive status epilepticus, a 30-minute definition is neither practical nor appropriate in the clinical practice. So once a seizure have continues for more than a few minutes, treatment definitely should be started without any further delay. So for all practical purposes, a patient should be considered to be in status epilepticus if a seizure persists for more than five minutes. Then as per the Neurocritical Care Society for Status Epilepticus, status epilepticus management in adult and children, it defines status as five minutes or more of continuous clinical or electrographic seizure activity or recurrent seizure activity without recovery between the seizures. That is, there are two conditions under this. This duration of this seizure activity should be more than five minutes. It may be a clinically convulsive stage or an electrographic seizure activity. And second is, either it, it could be a status if uh, there is repeated seizures within this more uh, lasting more than five minutes without recovery between the seizure, that is without recovery to the baseline status. 
than the burden of the disease. The overall incidence of the status epilepticus in children is roughly 18 to 23 per 1 lakh in a year in children younger than 2 years of age. And it has some mortality too. It has been reported to be 2 to 7 percentage mortality. And we should know that the febrile status epilepticus accounts for 5 percentage of the febrile seizures and for up to 25 percentage of old status epilepticus in children. But other, other than in adults, usually around 25 percentage, one fourth of the cases of status epilepticus in children may result from a, seizure, a febrile illness. Then the status epilepticus can be divided into again three types. That may be a generalized convulsive status epilepticus, a non-convulsive status epilepticus, or a focal motor status epilepticus. Status epilepticus with convulsions, that is generalized convulsive status epilepticus, may be more likely to lead to long-term injury. And the, the patient may be, or the child may be presented with uh, different types of convulsions, or uh, jerky movements, or grunting sounds, drooling, or rapid eye movement like that. And in non-convulsive, in non-convulsive status epilepticus, child may appear confused or look like they are daydream, daydreaming. They may not be unable to speak and may be behaving in an irrational way. And in case uh, this non-convulsive or a partial motor status is not associated with the same severity or sequelae or urgency of treatment as generalized convulsive status. But remember, if it is sustained, it may still result in permanent damage. Otherwise, the most attention should be given to generalized convulsive status epilepticus. While seeing this status epilepticus, we have to be familiar with two more terms. That is, one is refractory status epilepticus, another is super refractory status epilepticus. This refractory status epilepticus implies this epilepticus or status that continues despite adequate treatment with benzodiazepine and one anti-epileptic drug. That already we have started the treatment, we have administered two lines of medication, then again the patient is convulsing, then that time we can suspect a refractory status epilepticus that is not responding to the drugs. Then the second entity is super refractory status epilepticus. Here, if in a case of refractory status epilepticus, if the patient is not improving, maybe we may induce a pharmacological top, uh, coma. At that time also, if the child uh, continues to uh, in convulse for more than 24 hours, despite this anesthetic treatment or occurs or an attempted being of an anesthetic regimen, at that time, the status is known as super refractory status epilepticus, real, really an emergency. It has a mortality of around 20 percentage. That is actually in the status, the mortality rate is around two to seven percentage. When it become, uh, when it goes to super refractory or refractory, the mortality rate increases to around 20 percentage. Now, we can just see what happens in our body. I'm not going in detail, the theoretical aspects of uh, causing this seizure and what happens in the brain and just trying to explain what will be the clinical science. In the status epilepticus results from a combination of persistent cellular excitation and a failure of centrally mediated mechanisms to suppress a sustained seizure activity. And here, in the generalized seizures, it is also associated with several systemic physiological changes as a result of massive release of catecholamines. While with the, when the st child started to convulse, with massive release of catecholamines, and the early manifestations in the child may be that is within the first thirty minutes of status, the child may present with cardiac arrhythmias, like uh, that may be a tachyarrhythmia or uh, any uh, fibrillations or ventricular tachycardia, like that arrhythmias can occur, and child. May uh, show rebound hyperglycemia, then hypertension, lactic acidosis, or tachycardia. Then when it becomes prolonged, prolonged status, that's the time. As the time goes on, the child may develop hypothermia because of the severe convulsive and over metabolism. Then the child may go to hypoglycemia. First, there was hyperglycemia. Later, it will come to hypoglycemia. Then first, there was hypertension. Later, it will become hypotension. Then the patient may present with pulmonary edema. There may be chance of renal failure because of poor perfusion. And there may be chance of cerebral ischemia 
from hypoperfusion and produce uh, hypoglycemia or, or hypoglycemia. This is a this can uh, reduce the uh, means can uh, increase the morbidity and mortality in the child. Then, while seeing this pathophysiology, it is clear that. Then the beginning of the uh, seizure changes, there will be temporary systemic changes. As the time goes on, it will move to life-threatening systemic changes. And ultimately, that will result if it is not timely intervened and stopped. So the mainstay is our management. We have to manage the seizures as an urgently. That is, we had to just uh, differentiate whether it is a status or not. If it is a status, definitely we have to move on aggressive management. The aims of the management include maintenance of an adequate airway, breathing and circulation, the termination of the seizures and prevention of recurrence, then the diagnosis and initial therapy of life-threatening causes of status and the management of refractory status epilepticus. Now we can see this management in detail. First about the immediate management. The immediate management means when, when we get a child in the emergency room already, ma'am has explained well regarding how to assess a pediatric child and just by uh, looking into the pediatric assessment triangle itself, it, the appearance itself we can diagnose, it's maybe a seizure, okay. And, and basically you have to check the ABCs and in the case of LA, most often, the airway of the child is ceasing or convulsing style may be compromised with increased secretions. And sometimes, and because of this convulsity, there may be trismus that can cause airway compromise. So, immediately, you can turn the head of the child to one side and suction airway position properly to one side, or we can apply, uh, can attempt a jaw thrust method clear the secretions, but remember blind uh, suctioning is not to be attempted. It can cause in injuries in the patient. And we can maintain an airway using an oral airway or a nasopharyngeal airway. Then move on to check the breathing of the child. Initially, the child may be uh, breathing rapidly and uh, we had to check the respiratory means oxygen saturation of the peripheral oxygen saturation. If the saturation levels are low, that is below 90 percentage, we can administer the oxygen and uh, always remember to avoid hypoxemia, which can aggravate the cerebral or neuronal damages. And if the child is uh, continuously uh, moving on to hypoxia, consider bag marks back wall mass in relation, the first, because in an actively uh, ceasing child, it may be difficult to consider an endotracheal intubation. So first try with a back wall mass device, and later, if it is not improving, if the child is not improving in the oxygenation status, consider intubation as a rapid sequence intubation. And thirdly, we have to assess for the circulation. Then here we have to assess for the tachycardia, for the peripheral perfusions of the child, that usually that may be poor, and ensure appropriate monitoring. Immediately after getting the child in the emergency, we have to connect the child to this uh, cardiac monitor. We have to monitor, conti continuously monitor the child as early as possible, get an intravenous access, or if it is not possible, an intravenous access. And they uh, try to treat hypotension. If the child is in hypotension, we have to uh, add up with fluid recitation. Then the actual management of seizure. This management of seizure can be divided into three types. That is a drug, that is pharmacological management, that is emergent treatment with benzodiazepine. That should, that should be attempted as an emergency. Then urgent therapy, it's benzodiazepine like lurazepam, diazepam, or midazolam we can use. And in urgent therapy, phenytoin, phosphenytoin, phenobarbital, or levitrazeptam, or valproate sodium can be used. And if the seizure persists after this urgent therapy too, we can consider refractory treatment. At that time, we should induce a pharmacological coma using infusions of midazolam or phenobarbital. And one thing of most importance while working in this emergency department is that treating adequately at first is more likely to stop the seizures than repeated small doses. Treating adequately means adequate doses should be administered. The under dosage may be a reason for continuous seizure or continuing this status epilepticus. Always remember to uh, give the drug as per the weight of the child. Then 
we can move on to one by one. The first management, firstly, as soon as we get an intravenous line or intraocious line, administer the first anticonvulsant. Sometimes the child may, may have got a first aid either from the home or uh, from an emergency technician that may be an amidazolam or a or, uh, that means a buccal midazolam or an intranasal spray or sometimes a rectal midazolam. Anyway, whenever we are receiving the child in emergency room, the best drug or the drug of choice is lorazepam. A lorazepam at a dose of 0.1 milligram per kilogram over one minute and the maximum dose we can attempt is five milligrams. And meanwhile, we, while administering, after administering in one anticonvulsant, we can give at five minutes maximum or three to five minutes period, we can allow for uh, check whether it is being effective or not. At that time, we have to check the blood glucose. That is, a, uh, that is an urgency because most sometimes there may be hypoglycemia that can precipitate the seizures. So if we have found, uh, we found that the child is in hypoglycemic state, administer a bolus of five ml per kilogram of 10% percentage dextrose. If the child is old enough, we can use 25% dextrose. At that time, 2 to 4 ml per kilogram may be enough. And we have to immediately connect the child to the monitoring. That is, ECG monitoring continuously should be done and make sure that the child is not going into hypothermia, which can again worsen the cerebral perfusion. Then after five minutes, again, if the child is not improving, then we have to start with the second anticonvulsants. If the child is uh, child had uh, not received any prior treatment other than in the uh, hospital or the emergency room, we can just attempt one more shot of this lorazepam or midazolam, or otherwise just go to the second anticonvulsant. Mm -hmm. And here the anticonvulsants are choice is phosphenitoin or phenytoin. And the phosphenitoin can be administered at a rate of uh, the dose of 30 milligram per kilogram intravenously at three milligram of first point uh, phenytoin equ equivalent per kilogram per minute. Then the phenytoin can be administered at 20 milligram per kilogram IV at one milligram per kg per minute and the maximum rate that can uh, at which this phenytoin can be infused is around 50 milligram per minute. And one thing you have to and keep in mind that this drug should not be given too rapidly. This uh, phenophosphenatoin we can give a little more rapidly. Within five minutes, we can administer. But for the phenytoin, it should take around 20 minutes as per the, uh, for the effective management. And one more thing is that usually the phosphenatoin is preferable in children as it can be missed with any type of fluid and tissue necrosis following extravasation does not occur. Especially when a pediatric or a young child is considered, they may have a thin and fragile vein. And if you're giving this for a Phenytoin can cause uh, tissue damage, and so phosphenytoin is more preferred. Then at the same time, we have to uh, move on to further investigations. So we have to do further blood investigations. We should check the calcium, magnesium, sodium, phosphate, renal function test, liver function test, coagulation profile, uh, arterial blood gas analysis, complete blood count, toxicology screening, anticonvulsant levels, and if neither, it, uh, neuroimaging also, head CT can be done. But this, this depends upon the discretion of the treating physician. Because if it's a simple febrile seizure, that may not be much, much indicator. If, uh, if any suspicion behind this cause of seizure is there, but move on as per the uh, guidelines. And if it is found, if the child is found hyponatremic, low sodium levels are there, give five milligrams per kilogram of 3% saline. And if uh, he's found hypocalcemic, give 20 to 25 milligrams per kg of calcium chloride too. And remember, if the seizure continues 10 minutes after completion of the second antical medicine, already I have explained in the practice status epileptic is that a status that continues after the first shot of benzodiazepine and second anticonvulsants that can be considered as a refractory status. We have to alarm regarding the refractory status. So then we have to add up a third anticonvulsant. Usually the drug of choice as a third anticonvulsant is levetiracetam that can be given at a rate of 40 to 60 milligram per kilogram intravenously at five milligram per kg per minute. 
and consider in the patient this hemodynamic instability. It will not cause much instability in the patient, levetiracetam, or possible metabolic or liver diseases, or, or otherwise we can ask sodium valproate, 40 milligram per kg intravenously at 5 milligram per kg per minute. And uh, we should know that this sodium valproate is contraindicated in liver disease, thrombocytopenia, and possible metabolic diseases. Or otherwise, we can opt to phenobarbitol, 20 milligram per kg IV at 2 milligram per kg per minute. This, when using this phenobarbitol, it can cause respiratory depression and hypotension too. So we should be vigilant while we are administering this phenobarbitol. So that is our three lines of management. First, benzodiazepine, second, anticonvulsants, and say that phenytoin and phosphenytoin, or third, anticonvulsants, levetiracetam, sodium valproate, or phenobarbital. Then again, the seizure continues. Five minutes after the third anticonvulsants, consider another third line drug or proceed to pharmacological phloma initiation. If, if we have given levetiracetam, we can just try phenobarbital or a sodium valproate. Otherwise, just move on to pharmacological coma initiation. But if you're moving to uh, sedate the child completely, Definitely, we have to secure an LV prior to that because if you're infusing this midazolam, it can cause respiratory depression and the child may go further a hypoxemic. So, secure an LV and ventilate the child using mechanical ventilator. Try to obtain a central venous line and the arterial line. Continuous EEG monitoring may be needed at that time. Why this continuous EEG monitoring? Because we are sedating and keeping an induced coma. At that time, the child's body may be stable, like a vegetable, but the electric convuls electroconvulsive activity will be continuing. So we have to get done continuous EEG monitoring to, uh, to confirm that whether the seizure is being stopped or not. And we, had, we can initiate the coma with midazolam 0.2 milligram per kilogram bolus over the two minutes and start infusion at one microgram per kg per minute. Then also if the seizure persists, if uh, persists at that time we can give another shot of midazolam bolus that is point already ever mentioned, that is 0.2 milligram, one bolus was being given. Then again, if uh, and start of one microgram per kg per minute, again, if the child is convulsing, we can try another shot of midazolam, 0.2 milligram per kg, and we can increase the rate to two micrograms per kg per minute. And like that, if the search persists at a maximum dose of midazolam, that means 30 micrograms per kg per minute, consider another one, that is phenobarbital infusion, three to five milligrams per kg bolus followed by 0.3 to 3 milligram per kg per hour infusion. And when, this, when we are inducing this pharmacological coma and we have found out that the child has been stopped the seizures, we should not abruptly, uh, abruptly remove this uh, means anticonvulsant drugs or coma drugs from the patient. We have to continue the pharmacological coma for 24 hours of last seizure and ensure that additional anticonvulsions convulsions are added up to provide coverage during weaning from coma. And we can reduce the midazolam by 0.5 micrograms per kg per minute every three hours with EEG monitoring. To sum up, the management of this uh, seizure or pediatric status epilepticus in emergency, the time approach. As I have already told you, as the time elapses, the chance of uh, fatality also increases. So within two minutes of getting the child, we have to maintain a non-invasive airway protection and we have to ensure that the gas exchange is proper with proper head positioning or administering oxygen like that. And vital signs should be assessed, blood glucose and other relevant investigation should be done within this two minutes. And within the five minutes, we have to conduct a brief neurological examination, obtain an IV access and emergent anti-seizure medication that is a benzodiazepine should be administered and start with fluid recitation if it is indicated in the child. And within 10 minutes, intubate if airway or gas exchange is compromised or if the child is having an increased or elevated intracranial pressure. And within 15 minutes, if needed, we should start a vasopressor to support the child. And within 16 minutes, we have to complete this neuroimaging. That is, if suspected, or not all, for all cases, in suspected etiological cases only, we are doing neuroimaging and lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is not 
that meant advised in actively seizing child, first of all, stabilize the child and then, not, then only move for the lymph puncture, detail of blood workup, and also we are to conduct continuous EEG monitoring. Then about certain drugs which we are inducing, we are uh, using for this uh, seizure management. First, uh, first the drug is midazolam. It can be administered in fall roots. It can be administered intravenously or intravenously. Already I have explained to you, it is 0.15 milligram per kg or up to 2.2 milligram per kg we can administer. And we can give it IM2, that is 0.2 milligram per kg. If it's in the, in the hospital, if they're not getting an intravenous or intravenous access, or if, if the central line is being uh, uh, delayed, at that time, we can attempt an IM shot, 0.2 milligram per kg. And also in the out hospital settings, this can be administered buccal at a rate of 0.5 milligram per kg or an intranasal spay of 0.5 milligram per kg, and the, but the maximum dose should be 10 milligram. And while speaking about the diazepam, the second benzodiazepam, it, it can be administered either intravenously, intravenously, or per rectal. Per rectally, it is well absorbed. It can be given 0.5 milligram per kg. That can also be given in the hospital setting. But whenever when the child comes into the emergency room, the lorazepam is the best choice. It can be administered at IV intravenously or intravenously. It's 0.1 milligram per kg. This lorazepam has little respiratory depressant effect than other benzodiazepines. Then if you're given the spinatoin, usually uh, the patient may be getting the phenatoin in the post, uh, in the seizure patients. Here already mentioned that the intravenous or intravenous, the dose is 20 milligram per kg, and that should be administered over 20 minutes. And always remember to dilute this uh, Phenatoin with a sodium chlorate, 0.9% maximum concentration of 10 milligram in one ml. Try to induce in a large vein because it is severely irritant. It's an alcohol, um, means uh, the pH is high. It can cause dysrhythmias and hypertension in the child. So therefore, while giving this, administering this phenatoin, we have to monitor the ECG and blood pressure of the patient. And it has little depressant effect on this respiration. And uh, if you're given the sphenobarbital, this can also give another same uh, dose like phenytoin, that's 20 milligram per kg, maximum is one gram. It should also be administered over 20 minutes. Ensure that the airway support is available. It is always respiratory de depressant, often causes respiratory depression, and we have to monitor the blood pressure. This phenobarbital uh, and uh, the uh, phenobarbital, phenytoin, and phosphenytoin, everything has long acting anti -convulsants. Sometimes some of the non-convulsive status epilepticus. I have already explained to you that if you're inducing a pharmacological coma, definitely you have to monitor the EEG in order to assess whether the status is being continuous. If a child does not begin to respond to a painful stimuli after 20 to 30 minutes of a tonic-clonic seizure episode, suspect a non-convulsive status and we have to take an urgent ECG. Up to 20% of the children with status epilepticus has non-convulsive status epilepticus after tonic cloning status epilepticus. First, it may be started as tonic cloning. Later, as the time elapses, that may uh, subside. The convulsions may subside, but the electrical activity may not be subsided. Then some words about nursing intervention. I have already mentioned the intervention, the mainstay of management is giving drug therapy and assessing the child and stabilization of the child. We have to be very sure to prevent the trauma or injury in the child. Then uh, you have to keep promote the airway clearance. We have to keep the patient uh, in a safe area have an oral airway, adequately suction, oxygen should be provided with monitoring of saturations and suction apparatus and everything should be readily available. And the, keep this bed in low position with the side rails up, it should not cause an injury to the child. So consider parting the side rails. If the child is seizing, stay with him to protect him from the injury and observe the seizure activity. Always remember to monitor and document each and see each seizure event, this duration of the event, what all drugs we are giving at the correct, with correct time and signature of the person who has been uh, given this intervention. So that's all regarding my brief topic, a seizure and emergency. Thank you, organizers, for giving me a chance to communicate.
Thank you, Disha Vaggis, for your informative session on neurological emergency. You have very nicely explained in capsule form about the status epilepticus and the different management and the different pharmacological management, even the nursing interventions. Thank you for your presentation. So we have received some questions from the side of participants. So I would like to share their questions with you. The first question asked by Aishwarya, her question is, which type of seizure is more dangerous in children? Actually, the seizure with uh, resultant generalized tonic-clonic convulsion, which lasts more than, more than five minutes, is dangerous in children. If it's a febrile status epilepticus, there may not be a recurrent seizures after this uh, episode, but if there is a pathology behind it, if an intracranial pathology or a head injury uh, like that, or an epilepsy, at that time, that may be continued in the lifetime. Okay, thank you, Jisha. Another question through by Anaga. Her question is, what is the duration of status epilepticus in child? So I think Anaha hasn't listened to my slide completely, presentation completely. I had already explained that. And theoretically, you may find that uh, this a, a start, uh, seizure continues more than 30 minutes is considered as a status. But actually, for all practical purposes, more than five minutes duration of a seizure is considered as a status because we can't wait for 30 minutes to intervene. Uh, by that time, the patient may have developed the fatality so cerebral injury. Okay, so the time limit is five minutes. Re either continuous seizure of five minutes or repeated seizure without regaining of consciousness between the episodes or in this five minute period. Yeah, thank you, Jisha. Next question asked by uh, Ayan. His question is, what management to be done when the child is at school when he is getting seizure? Actually, the role of school the, nurse. Okay. So uh, in, in that school, mainly if, if you're experiencing a child having seized and fall down in this uh, uh, floor, actually first thing we have to do is make the patient safe. We should not uh, get any injuries and make sure that the airway is clear. We should, he's not aspirating anything. It's not uh, causing any injury to the child. At the same time, if a school nurse is available, they can administer the midazolam if it is available, either buccal midazolam that will that is well absorbed, buccal midazolam that is it can be administered in this lower gum between the cheeks and the gum. And uh, if it is given as a slow shot, it will be well absorbed. And otherwise, a, a, they can give an intranasal spray of midazolam. Already I have explained regarding the doses, everything in this presentation. So that will be nice. Otherwise, uh, if we can stay with the child, if it's uh, uh, if it ceases spontaneously within five minutes, there will not be much problem. with stabilize the child. If seizure continues, get an emergency medical attention. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jisha. Another question uh, asked by Marbane. Her question is, the infusion of paracetamol or syrup for convulsion can be given when he started fever at which Fahrenheit exactly? So what is the temperature, uh, the, uh, the extreme temperature point to give the paracetamol? That is a question. So actually, the there, is, uh, uh, there is no that much uh, correct guideline regarding starting of paracetamol. When starting the seizure, and we find out that after, despite giving this benzodiazepam, the seizure is not subsiding. That means there is increased metabolic demands, increased convulsive activity. Naturally, the patient uh, temperature may shoot up. Okay, so at that time itself, we can prophylactically start the paracetamol infusions or start any other rapid cooling measures like blankets and all. Yeah, thank you. So next question is, if febrile seizure occurred and there is no pathology found, so can we expect a seizure happen again? This question asked yes, by Divya. <laughs> Okay, we can expect a seizure again because not all children having a fever experiences a seizure. But one thing is that in the same 
illness period the same febrile illness period this febrile seizure usually doesn't recur okay it can recur so all patients who have a febrile illness or febrile seizure history the parents should be uh, clearly advised regarding taking caution regarding this uh, prevention of seizures yeah i'm very really happy to uh, we are we have been receiving many questions from the side of the participants but uh, because of the, we are running short of time i am taking on another only one question from this uh, session so this question asked by kaval duwadat and this question is which is the best line for giving phenytoin is it peripheral or central line definitely it is a central line the best line but remember it can cause cardiac arrhythmia it should be infused very slowly over the 20 minutes period if the central line is not at all available we can use the peripheral line yeah thank you disha uh, for answering all the questions i hope the disha answered all the questions through by the participants so once again thank you for your informative session thank you all so next moving to the another uh, session of the last topic of this webinar i would like to uh, get your attention of the participants so i am very happy to see that continuously we have been uh, getting more than 1300 participants are watching this live session so it's a very uh, you are giving a very good support to us and uh, I, I, again i want to tell you one thing that uh, you will get the posters only after the completion of this webinar so please do do not post the uh, link for the posters uh, again and again so i am again repeating you will get only the posters after the completion of this webinar only so i am requesting you do not please post the uh, for the uh, don't do not request for the posters link again and again in the chat box but you could throw your questions about the topic the speakers will answer the your questions and i also want to tell you again that the posters link will be active only for 24 hours after the completion of this webinar so again i am reminding you to get the certificate from our side you should get the minimum of 70 percentage mark for the posters so the thing is you can repeat the or you can do the Uh, uh, many attempts to get a 70 percent mark, but the link would be active only for 24 hours. That you should keep in mind. And another important uh, thing, I just want to convey you that while you are filling the form, you should keep your eye wide open so that you won't make any mistake, spelling mistake while you are writing your name and email ID. okay thank you for your uh, uh, thank you for watching and at the same time i just want to inform you that uh, the indian society of emergency and cardiac nurses uh, has been conducting many webinars and many educative sessions so if you would like to get the the updates of our program please subscribe our youtube channel thank you so with this i am moving to the another session of today's webinar for that it's my pleasure and pride to introduce the next orator for today's webinar professor elizabeth woki she is gonna discuss with you the circulatory emergency her topic is sporting sepsis in children about professor elizabeth woki she has done a bsc nursing program from cmc punjab in 2001 and 2000 between 2001 and 2005 after that she did her masters program in pediatric nursing from father muller college of nursing mangalore karnataka during the year 2008 and 2010 now she is pursuing phd in nursing from kerala university of health and allied sciences since 2014 she has worked as a nursing tutor lecturer assistant professor and associate professor in various institutes between 2005 and 2020 so she has more than 15 years of teaching experience currently she has been working as a deputy 
chief nursing officer in Baby Memorial College Hospital, and also she has been working as a professor at Baby Memorial College of Nursing since 2020. The most important uh, for a point is uh, point is she has published many articles in national and international journals. Over to you, ma'am. Please. Thank you, Jessel. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. So first and foremost, let me congratulate the young, vibrant nurses who are in this platform who are taking their effort to make this even a successful one. And I'm so proud to see all of you so energetic in uh, bringing up these forms of platforms for making our uh, population or our nurses more vigilant and more informative in various areas. So very happy to have that. So can I share my slide now? Of course, ma'am. Just a second. Is it, uh, can you see this? Yes. Okay. So once again, a warm uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, seminar on circulatory emergencies, the webinar on circulatory emergencies, spotting sepsis in children. So I'm not going more into various introductions so that is because we are already short of time. So we'll be going through various uh, spots of today, as we already said, the spotting of uh, sepsis. Our spots for the session are, we'll be just dealing what is sepsis, the pathophysiology on that, the clinical science, the home ground, various bundles, which has been used uh, for management of this uh, sepsis and the take home mes uh, message. So we use, as you all know, sepsis is like, it is a kind of uh, syndrome or it consists of various science, pathological, physiological and biochemical, which is causing a uh, traumatic or it is causing a high mortality rates in children. And this is a leading cause of death nowadays. And if it is not identified at early time, and if it is not recognized initially and the prompt management, if it is not done, that is a primary cause for death among children when there is an infection. So to define sepsis is uh, something or it is a, re a release of various chemicals when into the bloodstream when uh, it has been infected by various forms of bacteria, virus or fungi. So this we'll just see on to the evolution of this uh, disease. We had this SIRS, it, the SIRS is a systemic inflammatory uh, response syndrome. And then we had the sepsis and plus sepsis was considered as to be the SIRS plus the infection. And then we had the severe sepsis, which was a sepsis plus hypoperfusion or dysfunction of at least one organ. And finally, we had this form a septic shock, which is a sepsis plus hypotension when, when it's unresponsive to volume replacement. So this was the evolution of this disease. So the sepsis has various steps, as we already said, we have the SIRS, the sepsis, severe sepsis, and the septic shock. So this SIRS means when there is any of these criteria, any of these criteria, we consider it as an SIRS. And that includes any temperature more than 100.4 degree Fahrenheit, respiratory rate if it is greater than 20, and when the heart rate is greater than 90, and all these forms of criteria. Whereas sepsis is any two criteria criteria of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome plus the confirmed or suspected infection. If it is there, we call it a sepsis. And severe sepsis is like when we have sepsis plus when signs of uh, end organ damage or when there is hypotension, like systolic blood pressure of less than 90 and uh, based upon the age also, and if the lactate level is greater than 4 millimole. So we'll see how this uh, lactate is accumulated and all. Then finally, we have the septic shock. That is a severe sepsis with persistent signs of end organ damage and the hypotension of uh, the systolic blood pressure of less than 90 and lactate is greater than 4 millimole. So this is a pediatric uh, SIRS criteria or the systemic inflammatory response system that is a modified uh, criteria. We should have uh, two of the four criteria and the temperature or leukocyte abnormality and the temperature should be less than 36 degrees Celsius or greater than 38.5 degrees Celsius as there is a warm as well as a cold uh, shock. The, type, this, the tachycardia like heart rate if this is greater than 2 SD above normal for the age of bradycardia if it is less than one year old. And respiratory uh, rate, we can see that it is a mean respiratory rate that is greater than 2 SD above normal for the age or when there is a mechanical ventilation required for an acute process. 
And moreover, when there's an elevated or depressed WBC for according to the breach, which is not related to the chemotherapy, which induced the leukopenia, or when there is greater than 10 percentage of immune, uh, immature neutrophils. So I'll just show you a, a, simple, a small picture where you will be able to understand more about it. So we have this, this as the intervascular space. This is the intracellular space, and we have the interstitial space over here. So this is the normal, you have to just know about this anatomy so that we will be able to understand more about this pathophysiology. So I'll just have, give you a video on that. So just watch on this. Here we can see the sepsis this is a condition as I already described is caused uh, by the presence of microorganisms or any toxins into the tissue or the bloodstream. So when this uh, organism, as we said, the bacteria, it will be entering through various different sites. It will be uh, by means of various catheters also when there's a pot cat and there is any uh, silicone or when there is any endotracheal tube, periphery IV lines, inner conti, all these things. It's a source for this infection. So you can see here, this is a normal blood vessel, what we have, and the uh, blood is flowing very uh, normally in the bloodstream or in the capillaries. And once you can see uh, when the flow is normal and when there is an attack of any sorts of uh, infection or when there's an attack of any microorganisms, you can see the bacteria gets multiplying there. So this is the animation what we can see here. This is the bacteria which is entering into the uh, capillaries. And here you can see it is going to release some endotoxins. So this release of endotoxins will be triggering the cytokines or the WBCs, which will come to as uh, in order to respond to it or in order to attack this endotoxin. And that will be uh, releasing certain inflammatory systems like cytokines. So this combination of these releasing of endotoxins from the uh, WBC, sorry, from the uh, organism and the cytokines from the WBC, they together will be forming this sepsis or finally we cause septic shock. So, and we can see that the main organs which are affected is the lungs, the kidney and the, the brain and the heart. So when you just see about the uh, lungs, you can see here, this is the alveoli. And as we already said, there, when there is the, uh, when the microorganisms enter the scapularies, they will be creating certain kinds of barriers or they will be just breaking the barriers of the capillaries and this blood will be oozing out. So here you can see that the sepsis will be causing the fluid to leak into the lungs when you consider to the lungs. And here that will be preventing the exchange of carbon dioxide or the oxygen exchange will be uh, hunted or hunted there. And that will not help in the normal process exchange of blood, uh, oxygen saturation. So this is this will be resulting in oxygen decreased amount of blood in the uh, lungs. And when we consider to the various capillaries over here, the veins and all, the same thing happens here. The clot has been formed and uh, the RBCs, when they flow throughout, you can see that when this inflammatory response happens, the uh, it will be leaking uh, down, leaking through the capillaries outside and we'll be uh, seeing that plates and platelets are formed and these RBCs will be clubbed together to form small clots inside the cap the vessels. And here you can see the clots are forming and that will be hindering the normal flow of the RBCs. And this will cause hypoxia or this will not give the proper amount of blood to the various organ system, which will be leading to various uh, dysfunctions of the organ or the system failure. So we can see here the when the blood supply is not going appropriately to the vital organs, that will become dead or uh, the system will be on failure. So under one uh, video, we will be more able to understand. So you can see here, this is the normal uh, vessel, the fluid, the blood is moving very, uh, very peacefully. We have the healthy erythrocyte moving up and we can see the sepsis or the invasion of the microorganisms into the scapularies. So this is the green colored one, which is the my bacteria, which will be releasing certain kinds of endotoxins out. So when this endotoxins are released, uh, once it is released outside, there will be activation of endothelial cells and recruitment of leukocytes. As I already said, these are some, uh, they will be coming with certain weapons. It's like that, some an army, they are coming there and they will be macrophaging all these forms and uh, they'll be phagocyting the bacteria. Once it has been phagocyte, they'll be releasing various other forms of inflammatory uh, I, uh, levels. And when that is there, the epithelial cells are just binding to the walls of here. You can see here, this is like, it's something like this. So when there's a when there is the inflammation happens, there's a vasodilation, and what happens is that the adherents or the epithelial cells will be moving out. So this will be creating a bad, uh, like it will be opening uh, or it will having an exit for the blood to move outside the blood vessels. So here you can see when it others to the epithelial cells again, 
you can see this uh, that, that they are releasing various other forms of inflammatory uh, process. So, so septic shock will be leading to break of the epithelial junctions, which will be leading to endothelial uh, the dysfunction of the endothelial barrier. So here you can see the drying epithelial cells; they are all all dying, and the space, the junction is also widened. So here you can see there will be EC uh, removal or EC uh, lodging of blood from the capillaries to the outside area. And here you can see the RBCs, which was moving so fast, it is going slowly. The various clots are being formed here and there. So this uh, dysfunctional endothelial barrier will be causing this capillary leakage, decreased blood pressure, decreased tissue oxygenation, and ultimately there will be organ failure. So this is the basic pathophysiology what you can see here. So this is a simple uh, video which we will be able to understand like how an organism is entering into a body, how an infection is being uh, created and what is happening once the, once the infection or the microorganisms enter the body, what it has been releasing, the endotoxins are released. Once endotoxins are released, the WBC feels the need for an attack or they just want to uh, save themselves and they are coming, they are releasing the cytokines and the inflammatory process is going on. Once the inflammatory process is going on, you can see the endothelial barrier is being broken and there is leakage of the blood, uh, the blood to the other interstitial uh, area, and that is causing the decreased blood flow. And when the blood flow is not proper, moving properly, you can see the clots are being formed, and this is hindering the normal process of uh, RBC to circulate to the various vital organs. And 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 end result is that there will be the death of the various organ system. So this is the normal. This is a process which happens in sepsis, and with this you can know that the various manifestations that will be happening. So this is just a diagrammatic representation what we have already said. The local infection is caused by bacteria. The bacteria will be entering the bloodstream. The immune system will be responding to fight the infection. And the bacteria and the immune cells spread throughout the body causing uncontrolled inflammation. So we have to remember one thing is that like if I have shown you in this uh, video, it's not happening in one area. It is through the entire body. So you can see what will be the immune system or the inflammatory response that, is, that will be happening throughout the body. So that will be leading to the organ damage and death if it is left untreated. So you can see the various clinical signs and hemodynamic variables. So this sepsis has been defined based upon certain clinical variables. So first and foremost, hypothermia or hyperthermia. As I already said, the blood when it's been uh, coming out uh, and uh, the blood will be uh, leaking the capillary from the capillary. They'll be, you can see that uh, a body will be becoming more cool, cooler on that area. And we can see when the blood is not properly supplied to the brain, there'll be altered mental status and peripheral vasodilation, as we already said, uh, when the inflammatory response happens, the, the, vessel, the vessels will be dilated and that will be causing this warm signs so, uh, and uh, the vasoconstriction with capillary refill of greater than two seconds. You can see that will be leading to cold shock and the heart rate also will be increased because when the blood is not flowing appropriately to the vital organs, especially to the heart, you can see the heart will be pumping very badly in order to maintain its cardiac output. So the heart rate will be naturally increasing. The various hemodynamic variables, we can see the perfusion pressure. But as we saw in this video also, the RBC is very moving very slowly. The perfusion pressure also will be decreased. And that will cause the slow movement of the uh, blood, blood to the various organ, vital organs. And oxygen utilization, as we already seen, this RBCs, when it is not moving appropriately, the oxygen level will be decreased. And you can see the cardiac output also will be decreased. And HB concentration also comes to a uh, very lower level as there is leakage of these blood vessels into the other interstitial spaces. So this is how we will be able to understand the pathophysiology along with the clinical manifestations. So just to have a very simple uh, explanation of various signs and symptoms, you can just define based upon the sepsis. So S stands for shiver, fever or very cold, E for extreme pain or general discomfort, P for pale or discolored skin, S for sleepy, difficult, sleepy or difficult to rose or they feel like confused as I always said there's mental alterations and I, I feel like I might die because the whole inflammatory process is taking uh, throughout the body and there'll be shortness of breath. So when it comes to sepsis we have to remember it's about time so we have to watch for the temp T for temperature higher or lower than normal, I infection whether they have any signs and symptoms of any infection, M for any mental decline whether they're confused whether sleepy or very difficult to arose them from the sleepiness and E for extremely ill, whether they have severe pain, discomfort or shortness of breath. So when we see there are various forms of recognition bundles, so we call it as the home bundle. Sorry. So this is recognition bundle. The home bundles are used mainly for management of sepsis. 
So here we have the recognition bundle, resuscitation bundle, stabilization bundle, and performance bundle. This is based upon the various evidence bases that I have formulated. So here in the recognition bundle, we should have a trigger tool in order to early identify the signs of or signs and symptoms of the sepsis so that the initial or the immediate management of the uh, sepsis could be done. And rapid clinical assessment has to be done within 15 minutes, activation of resist, uh, sepsis resuscitation bundle within 15 minutes. So that takes only around the 15, yeah, like a 30 minutes period. So this is the recognition bundle where rapid and immediate spotting of the sepsis has to be identified. So this is one, one of the example uh, I could show you. Uh, that is a pediatric septic shock collaborative triage trigger tool. Here you can see how the bundle is going on, how the process is there. They will be having general assessment. And if it says yes, yes, how the resuscitation is being taken process and all. So this is easily available. And you, you ask, even the institution can develop such kinds of uh, pediatric septic shock uh, trigger tools, triage trigger tools, so that we will be able to uh, easily identify any children or any pediatric client who are in the highly risk of septic shock. So as already discussed, in that initial stage, I said it is a 15 minutes period where you should have a rapid assessment. So in that, we have to check for the appearance, the circulation to skin, and the breathing. So in the appearance, we have to see about the abnormal tone, their uh, interactiveness, the consolability, their abnormal look, and the speech. Regarding circulation, we have to see whether there are any pallor, mottling, or cyanosis because there is no proper supply of bed. And breathing, we have to see the abnormal sounds, any abnormal position of retractions, apnea, and all. So once you do that, we should be always uh, remember, especially in sepsis, uh, we have to follow this sequence of CAB: circulation first, airway first, uh, airway second, and the breathing last. So this is because the circulation is a very important aspect, especially in, uh, when we deal with a distributive shock that the blood is not pooling properly to the vital organs. So in such conditions, when you see a patient in shock. And if you identify it as a shock, you have to make the person in an upright position so that the blood will be completely circulating to the brain because the brain is a vital organ where it is, there, there is more necessary or more, more need for the circulation to happen. So this is what we have the CAB. And then we can have some history uh, regarding the, uh, it could be uh, understood by means of this acronym like SAMP. Sample means symptoms, A for allergies, M for medications, any past history, last oral intake, and events which where the person was presenting. So this is a general assessment where we can do uh, to identify the sepsis. So under one very uh, important as well as a very quick response is a Q SOFA. It is a, uh, we call it as a SOFA score. And SOFA stands for any uh, like sequential organ failure assessment. Previously, it was, it was defined as Quick sepsis related organ failure assessment, but now it has been modified. And in pediatrics, also we have a P, uh, P sofa, not as a Q, we have a P sofa in the pediatrics. Also. So, when it is to the emergency department, if a child presents with various symptoms or with these sofa scale, we call it as respiratory rate when it is uh, greater than or equal to 22. And uh, then, when the cognition level, uh, we will be able to identify if there's any altered cognition. And if the systolic blood pressure is less than or equal to 100 millimeter of mercury. So this is a three important uh, three uh, bundle triangle, which will be helping you to rule out or recognize a sepsis, especially in the emergency department. So this is a respiratory altered cognition and systolic blood pressure, which is giving you a complete uh, view about the hemodynamic status of the child. So this is the normal uh, scoring system you can see here. So if the quick sofa scale of greater than or two, the point if it is greater than two, it suggests a poor outcome and should alert clinicians of possible infection when previously not. Known. So this is a this happens. This is a vital area where the nurses plays a role. Like if you identify with a quick sofa uh, scale that the point is greater than or equal to two, it's a very alert sign where the outcome will be very uh, very the outcome is very less or it is not. Uh, feasible. So we have to immediately contact the clinician and do the appropriate measures. So the sepsis clinical criteria, we can see, as I already mentioned, that we're having an infection, then this, the SOFA score, you can see it will be greater than or equal to two. And along with that, we'll be able to pull out that we've decreased uh, PO2 and FiO2, decreased glass coma, coma scale uh, score, the hypotension, then the, there will be increased bilirubin. This is because as we already said, like when the blood is not flowing, 
properly through the kidney. So this bilirubin also will be accumulated, sorry, it's through the liver, the bilirubin also will be accumulated in that liver and that will be causing increased bilirubin level there. And regarding the platelets, it will be decreased and the creatinine as well as there will be oliguria. So this is similar with like when the blood is not properly flowing through the kidney, the vital organ, the creatinine is also not filtered and that will be accumulated uh, in the kidney and that will cause increased creatinine level. And when, once the blood flow is not going properly, obviously there will not be proper urine output and that causes oliguria. So when you rule out a child with sepsis, we have to make sure that if the urine output is, uh, is not more than one per hour, that um, one ml per hour, that is an indication for sepsis per kg. So it's a classically described forms of pediatric uh, sepsis. You have the cold shock and warm shock. So I'm not going in detail about this. So in pediatric, we can see most of the time it will be a cold shock for the children when compared to the adults. So second bundle is a resuscitation bundle where you have to have intra osseous uh, or IV access has to be there within five minutes. So it's a very uh, difficult time where we have to have an IV access as soon as possible and it should be within five minutes. And if normally we can see that when it's in the emergency department, we will not be able to get the IV site or the uh, intra osseous site within these minutes. So no nowadays we prefer to have ultrasound guidance central catheters even. And we should provide with appropriate fluid resuscitation has to be initiated within 30 minutes then the blood culture has to be done prior to administration of antibiotics. So this is a very important area where the nurses has to be very keen because some, many of the times you can see when a patient comes to the emergency department, we are so busy to take the uh, blood culture or busy to give the antibiotics or something like that. So it's, it is, should not be done. We have to have the blood culture prior to administration of antibiotic. And serum lactate is a very good indicator of uh, this, uh, the dysfunction of the organs and a CBC, like uh, as we already discussed, the, what is the RPC level, it will be lowered, the HP level, all those, the white blood cells, everything will, will be uh, ruled out, and the ABG level also. Then we should initiate the blood spectrum antibiotics within 60 minutes, appropriate use of peripheral central inotrop within 60 minutes. Because once we provide this fluid therapy, uh, our fluid resuscitation is being provided, and if we monitor the cardiac output is not coming up to the point, we have to, uh, have we have to start with the inotropes that will be helping for the cardiac output, the heart rate to increase, which will be causing the cardiac output to be uh, increased. So in emergency, the ED goals, emergency department goals of therapies is like we have to restore the normal mental status of the child when it has been coming to the ED. Threshold, uh, we have to maintain the threshold heart rate, as I already discussed, because the cardiac output is depending upon the heart rate as well as the stroke volume. And the peripheral perfusion has to be maintained, the palpable distal pulse should be there, and should maintain the BP for the age for the child. So this is a main uh, challenge for the people who are in the emergency department, and this has to be maintained before you ship the person to another area. So this is regarding the rule of 60, perform uh, intraosseous I if IV fail in 60 seconds, ball us up to 60 uh, cc per kg in 60 minutes, start inotrop at 60 ml if still in shock, administration of antibiotics within 60 minutes. So we have various forms of algorithm for children also in the initial station, especially when, uh, when there is a systematic screening for sepsis in children and how the various forms are being done within one hour and within the three hour period. So this is how the normal algorithm has been followed and this is available also. Then next, the third uh, bundle is stabilization bundle. Once you are in the fluid restriction speed done, this baby or the child is becoming uh, stable, you have to have the stabilization bundle. You should use the multimodal monitoring to optimize the fluid. You have to see the hormone like cardiovascular therapies to attain the hemodynamic goals. You have to confer administration of appropriate antimicrobial therapy and source control also. So this is the SOFA scale, which I've said to identify the hemodynamic status and uh, uh, how much it is improving or what is the uh, status of each organ. So this is how the uh, marking is done and the score is being uh, calculated. And the final bundle is a performance bundle. So we'll be measuring, measure the adherence to trigger resuscitation and stabilization bundle. And we have to perform an RCA, root cause analysis, to identify what was the barriers to adherence. Sometimes the child is not improving. <clears throat> we have to see what is the exact cause. It might be some uh, peripheral catheters or some any, any other forms of causes might be there. And you have to rule out that and that immediately have to uh, take care of. And you have to perform an action plan to address the identified barriers. So once you do all these forms of bundles, the first, as we already said, the resuscitation bundle, the other uh, trigger bundle and stabilization bundle, we have to rule out how effectively it has been come up and what is the condition of the baby.
So this is a simple example I could choose, uh, share about Children's Hospital of East Aero and Ontario's algorithm for septic shock. So it's very uh, briefly given how we have to deal with our child during the initial 10 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and the 40 minutes period. So here you can see the on the 10 minutes, the first bolus of normal slime, 20 ml per kg is given as IV push rapidly over the five to 10 minutes so that the flow of the blood is being, uh, is being uh, uh, like stimulated. So again here, one important thing that we have to remember is like, don't forget glucose. Like most of the time you can see a large proportion or the researchers have uh, identified that or the evidences have come up that most of the uh, large proportion of the septic children have adrenal insufficiency and which is associated with the increased mortality also. So once a child, if you suspect a sepsis, you should monitor the glucose as uh, this is an indication for that. And after doing all these forms of bundles and if the child is not able to survive according to the uh, the criteria so even dynamic monitoring and it is being done it is not appropriate you can for, for go from further therapies like extracorporeal therapies like extracorporeal membrane oxygenation continuous renal replacement therapy and therapeutic plasma exchange also so this is the final level uh, the initial bundle we will be uh, going through and if it is not able to manage there it will be taken to the higher level so to conclude the take-home messages we have to early diagnose we have to pr uh, have priority is like cab not uh, abc and the fluid resuscitation is a very important factor, the immediate immediate uh, management that we have to do. And the rule of six, we have to keep in mind that uh, we already discussed and the blood culture should be taken before any forms of antibiotic administration because we will not be able to identify what type of bacteria or fungal has infected us. And optimal antimicrobial use is to be done and don't forget glucose whenever you suspect a child with sepsis because I already said it's because of the adult insufficiency. So I think I'll wind up here as it is a very late time and we are so beyond the time here and, and now the session is open for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, ma'am, for your wonderful, fabulous, informative session regarding the sepsis in children. You have very uh, well explained uh, about the different aspects of sepsis, including the the bundle 60 and the, what is the role of nurse uh, while giving the antibiotics and the taking of the blood culture. I hope it was a, uh, the, for the participants, it was a very informative session. Thank you, ma'am, for your informative session. Thank you, thank you so much. So with this topic, we have finished all the topics of today's webinar. So now it is the time for what of thanks. So first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the speakers of today's webinar. For making this webinar more fabulous, informative and uh, elaborative one. I think all the speakers did their role very well with the excellent time management and proper explanation to the topic. On behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, once again, a special thanks to today's icons of the international webinar on pediatric emergencies for accepting invitation as an orator for this webinar. Next, I would like to express our sincere love and gratitude to the, uh, our, the our chief guest of today's webinar, Dr. Gredi Valjandran. As, as, uh, as you know, uh, even though she has been running with a busy schedule when our president Shaukat or ring her, she uh, has consented for the uh, inauguration officially. And uh, I think, uh, I hope uh, the ma'am's support would be with us uh, even for our upcoming programs also. Next, I would like to thank our the backbone of our academic council, Dr. Poonin Joshi. Unfortunately, she couldn't attend this webinar. She, uh, she is supposed to give the, uh, deliver this presidential address today but due to some urgent meeting, she couldn't attend this webinar, but uh, she has been extending her cons uh, consistent support and guidance for organizing all the webinars. Ma'am, thank you for your continued support and guidance. Next, I would like to uh, thank Ms. Gita Sinha for welcoming the gathering for today's webinar. And last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants of today's webinar. I think more than 1,500 participants continuously watch this webinar uh, throughout the time. And you might this webinar an interactive session by throwing different questions to the speakers. 
once again thank you all without you this won't be a successful one so on behalf of indian society of emergency and cardiac nurses i have special thanks to one and all and requesting your continuous support and cooperation for our upcoming programs also and uh, one more thing if you would like to get the notification of our programs please subscribe our youtube channel and uh, we have uh, many upcoming programs uh, on this march 28th we are going to conduct international webinar on patient safety management in emergency department that is we are going to uh, conduct on this march 28th and next our international webinar on neonatal emergencies that we are going to conduct on april 2nd uh, april 2nd and uh, the another emergencies that is we are going to conduct international webinar on psychiatric emergencies on april 24th so if you would like to get a notification of our different programs the online programs the virtual programs please subscribe our youtube channel that is isecon learning hub so again i am uh, requesting your continuous support and cooperation also i would like to remind you about the posters link now you could get you could you could see the posters link in the chat box so this is the time you can just start your attempt for the posters and again i am reminding you to get the certificate from our side you should get 23 marks 23 correct answer out of 30 questions and i also uh, want to remind you that it will take at least 2 to 4 weeks to get the certificates so we will provide the e certificate from our side so it will be provided to or it will be shared to your registered email id sometime you may get the certificate in your inbox sometime you should check your spam folder also because the, the certificate will get into the spam folder also again i just want to convey you one message i already told you many times when you are filling the posters please keep your eye wide open so as don't make spelling mistake in the in your name as well as in your email id it may delay further to get the certificate so thank you once again we'll see you in the next webinar series thank you all